All right. Well, I think we've stalled out for long enough. I got the tweet out. Everything for this has been a, a little bit of a scrambled mess, but I think we can do probably a little bit more of a formal intro uh, at this point for the guests that we've got. We meant to have one, perhaps even two guests joining us from Sweden from yesterday, but it wasn't to be because we had some internet problems. We were going to try to get fresh in here to talk a little bit about his experience in Sweden and how everything uh, has shaped up from his perspective, doing a major for the first time. But instead, we decided to, dr to drag in a couple of other British casters slash analysts who've done work in the tier one tier two scene for quite some time please welcome back to the post show one mr demo cast who joined us on the six invitational one from six months ago and making his debut looking like he literally just woke up 15 minutes ago mr x troika hello oh, boys because he did because he did jacob that's why <laughs> Listen, i get slandered in the first 30 seconds of being here one i'm getting told i'm a backup second i get told i could just woke him out of bed <laughs> I'm gonna welcome you guess. I Jacob, said, come I, on. I said, no, I said Wait, nothing about a backup, bro. Jacob, you, you, you described us as position. you described us as the others. That that's how the you describe us. <laughs> who was available, basically? And to be fair, we're also the others because we were available but didn't get picked. So we're all kind of in the same boat there, aren't we? They were like skipped over for even our guests. I mean, we wanted to have what fresh on here and yeah, yeah. we were gonna get people actually fresh. in you, there. You giving don't us want experience. fresh. No, you don't want him. You want us <laughs> to. True. That's who you want. But all we right, got well. you. Anyway, mm -hmm. so thank God that they didn't have workable Wi-Fi and you guys did so that now you can slander their performance uh, at the major and complain about how bad Fresh is as an analyst, obviously. Because he deserves the hate. We love Pengu. We don't like Fresh. Oh, I actually love Fresh, though. That guy's like the best. Yeah, he really is. He's a very oh, sweet like dude. Fresh. All right. So just for reference, gentlemen, uh, how much of this whole major escapade have you, have you guys been consuming? Obviously, you haven't had to watch every single match of ball in a row, but how much of this have you been watching? I'll go first because I think my answer is probably shorter than demos. Um, I've watched a decent amount. I think I hit day one pretty hard. Day, yeah. Today has been a bit of a mix just because a lot of the games didn't mean all too much. Um, sort of yeah, no kidding. Tweet earlier, Jesse. Um, Thank you. It was a, a little bit of a shame that we didn't have as high a stakes on the last day of the groups, but it's been fun. And I think I usually, I've, I've cherry picked my teams as I've gone along. I think I've, I've watched a lot of Fury, basically, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, I mean, they were your boys they... in Latam, right? Because that was the obviously that was the, the thing is that you were on, hyping up. On my prediction, I have predicted Phase to win the whole thing, and I'm still very confident in that. And I'm quietly confident that I that finally that's broke it. A good you possibility. Tell me I got to you. I finally well, got to you. Yeah, yeah. Demo, demo eventually <laughs> got through to my brain. Um, I knew that Fury. Well, I didn't think that Fury was going to win the whole thing, but mm. it's just such an exciting team to watch for me. And and then yeah, I've, I've been cherry picking those games a little bit. Those SSG games. I mean, find me better seeds than that. Mm. I I don't think I've watched like the opening games, like the first two games of the day, because I was sleeping. So I, I'm not. You know, I woke up pretty late the past three days. Um. So yeah, that's really been the only thing I've missed is kind of like the opening things. I don't think I've seen a rogue game. I'll be honest. I don't think I've watched rogue play, um, which is strange. Um, so yeah, other than that, I think I've kept up with Group D fairly well because it was like the most exciting one, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just just bits and pieces here and there, pretty much. So uh, Ollie mentioned that he was going for Phase Clan to win the whole thing. Did you kind of have like a tournament favorite or somebody who you were rooting for in any other capacity who to go say? all the way? I want to say I put PDS. I think I did. Um, okay i mean that's safe so yeah well here's the issue i put bds the win i put phase to be runners up and after watching that draw my heart's oh. it's because those are my two teams those are the two teams that i really that's really tough. like because there's a part of me that feels very sorry for bds because they're too good to not have won anything yet which is yeah. it, you know they have been the most dominant team in eu for what the most consistent dominance force for the past 18 months and for them not win anything yet is incredible the fact that they haven't uh, and then phase I fell in love with FaZe over this past split, so yeah, it's that, that's kind of where I'm at. So yeah, I'm feeling a little bit disappointed with how the draws went. You know, I agree. Mostly because I think uh, not many people expected BDS to be a number two seed coming out of that group, mm. especially the way that NIP finished up in Mexico. Yeah. Everyone kind of assumed if they get out, it'll be number two seed. Maybe even that would be kind of a challenge. But the fact that that draw went the way that it did, I am, I am a little <laughs> bit salty about it. But... Uh, we can talk more specifically about the way that the draw itself went uh, a little bit later. Tango, do we have updated standings we can talk about uh, each group individually? Are we good for that? Because if we, if we are, then I'd love to start talking about Group A first off. Because this was where, because we had most of the teams that were locked in for playoffs. Two of them got confirmed for yesterday in... Uh, God, who was it? It was NIP and Rogue. And then everyone mm -hmm. else got locked in within the first, like, 
four games, so to speak, yep. on both the streams up until we got to the very, very end of the day, which is where we had uh, Dom One get locked in and Team Empire obviously getting knocked out. So if we go group by group, starting in group A, this is where everything kind of came to a head. We were like, is like, FaZe Clan didn't really need anything crazy to make it out yeah. of this group. Uh, Chiefs were behind them by five points, so they were, were relying on FaZe Clan to get uh, there's like no points over the course of like their last two games and chiefs needed to win every single conceivable point that they could um but the two of them actually met i think in like one of their first games on the day and it just uh mm -hmm. it didn't work out for them at all yeah chiefs lost 7-1 to phase clan and that locked down the group so uh wasn't wasn't super competitive in the end there jacob 15 points for phase clan good good god yeah phase then went on to beat rogue 7-3 dominated the group other than that one seven five loss to Rogue, they were literally flawless uh, in this group stage. So it yeah. doesn't really get much more uh, decisive than that. Do we want to as well? You want to mention anything about OXG because, dear Christ, that's just a sad sight. <laughs> they get I mean, to go I, home. Thank I have God. something to say about auction. To be fair, and, yes. Right. I'm gonna start things off by saying I'm not trying to have a dig. Not trying to do any of that for auction. The circumstances they were put under. It is terrible. Yeah, everyone knows it sucks. For that to happen, you're losing Fox. Heavy, heavy hit. But the biggest thing is, is as soon as that news came out, it just looked as if they just gave up straight off the rip. Yeah. That's what I felt, and I don't understand why. Because at the end of the day, sure, things maybe not went your way. Sure, you've had, you know, this issue. But that doesn't mean you can't go out there and do something. We've seen wilder stuff happen in Siege before. We really have. And anything can happen. As soon as you put yourself in that mentality and you're almost showing everyone in your group that you don't care and you just want to get out, then they are going to ride that for everything they're worth. So I don't get why Auction showed that they didn't care right off the rip. Like, I think whenever you've seen them, um, like the three, the three of them, uh, what, Lax, um, Hopes, and Vert, all sat in the row and they, they just look sad. And it's like, you know, that, that, that tells a picture, that, tell, that tells a story. Yeah, it was, uh, it was depressing. I think the one game that they started to look like they had fun was the first game that they played today, which was them versus Rogue. It was the 8-7 victory for them. It was the one game that they won. And, like, they were just playing, you know, at that point they had nothing to nothing to lose, obviously, and they played like it, just like the dumbest siege you'd ever seen, at least for the first half, right? And so it's like, maybe if they'd worked that in a little bit more, but you're right. Like, it wasn't like they came into those games and just had fun and played really aggressive. They came in and they just, like, looked like they just wanted to quit. Like, it really looked like they showed up and were just like, can we get out of here as soon as possible, you know? I think especially if you contrast that with how Invictus have played. Like, mm -hmm. they've been playing with Gig as the stand-in. It's a, a very similar situation. And they've been going out there and they've been putting on really, like, interesting games and, and like, shit that's really fun to watch. And I think that's been, like, a bit of a, a, a comparison and a contrast that you can draw. You know, there's two teams at this major that aren't playing with the full five. And there's two di very different mentalities with how either team's approaching that. The issue is more that Hopes is just somebody who wasn't really able to hold his own in any context, I think. And Gig is somebody who definitely did because that man, you know, still Gig's does a play. Gunner, like... man. No, he totally is. And he showed it's it in like the last game of the gunner. day. Yeah. yeah. So for OXG, it's more a case of so the, the guy who they brought in uh, in a substitute role just wasn't somebody who was able to stand up to any level of competition whereas we saw Gig yeah. killing world champions you know today oh, and all through Gig's, all throughout Gig's the tournament, got a, cool. a shadow play drive bulging at the seams that he's trying to bring home from sweden <laughs> he's gonna be dining out on some of those for the rest of his life yeah he really was i think the fact that oxg also couldn't beat chiefs either time uh is kind of a testament to how bad they had all of their attacks fail, which is probably one of the more interesting things about the way that they played in the NAL for Stage 3. Um, they did beat Rogue. Uh, they got a dub. There wasn't a single team, I think, in this tournament that didn't get at least one win through the group stage. Uh, it took OXG until the very final day. It took Invictus until the last day as well to do that. But uh, sorry, OXG. Hopefully hopefully Fox A feels better and you guys can do something substantial for SI, but that's just not to be. Want to move yeah. into Group B, unless there's anything else you want to say about Group A, Jesse? No, they'll be back for invite. Yep. All right. So Group B, we knew Team 1 was getting out of here, and I called it. I said Sandbox was making it out. Hunter made a really big deal out of saying it was going to be Vitality, and none of us really had that much faith in Dark Zero, unless you did. Were you the one that 
I don't, I don't remember. Let's move open. past it. I don't, I don't remember. Let's move past it. Jesse, do you have something you need to tell the class? So I was really happy to see Sandbox get through. Everybody thought this would happen. Of course, uh, we all predicted this. Yeah. Um, they just had to beat Vitality, right? And I think they, yeah, they won, it on, they won it on Tiebreaker. So that was like a big game that started off the day. I think this was the first game. Yeah, this was the first game that got played um, on, I believe that was B-Stream, right? So, like, this was our, our very first matchup, and uh, dominant scoreline. Uh, Sandbox really locked that one down as fast as they possibly could. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was good stuff from them to be able to take that down and uh, beat up Vitality the first time that we've got two Koreans in. And, yeah, it's good to see them back after the terrible stage two they had. Anyone have uh, initial impressions of Team Vitality coming back to a first international event in two years? Vitality were in a weird spot. I think they're, they're doing a good very... job to get third. I, I think they've they've done not too bad for mm -hmm. for what it is. Yeah, like you said, haven't played... I can't remember the last time I've seen these guys at LAN event. Must be going back to Invite 2018, maybe? Was it, was it 19? I don't 2019, know. 2019, I think they said on stream earlier. Um, yeah, they, they, were, yeah. they were at um, Paris Major 2018, and then they made DreamHack yeah. Valencia 2019. I'm pretty sure it was the last mm -hmm. time they were anywhere that wasn't like a, a, a regional European LAN event for some reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's been it's been a yeah. it's been a while. Um. So yeah, I think the expectations was, you know, they they play they played pretty good. In the UL. obviously they they got the top four, but it's just they hadn't played a land together. Um, as a five, uh, at this kind of level, so it was always like a question mark in terms of what they could do. Again, put up a good effort. Um, they 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 had a very very unique play style. I feel throughout the course of the the kind of tournament, I think they played some some interesting siege, that. I, I think moments like that, especially whenever, you know, they're not the favorites, I would say, in that group. If you looked at, you know, who else was in there, yeah. um, they were able to sneak a couple of rounds in there, which I think did them wonders. There was an argument being made that uh, Kavana were the team that were primed to get that fourth spot and then kind of crapped the bed over the mm -hmm. last couple of days and then they couldn't make it. And I saw some people being like, well, Kavana wouldn't have made the same mistakes that Vitality did. And I don't really know how much of a leg that has to stand on, but uh from the games that i saw Kavana play i don't really know if they would have done that much better especially considering there are at least some people who understand kind of how an international land environment works and it would have been the f literally the first time like anyone from that Kavana squad had played at a tournament like anywhere Aside close to this Kenny. big so uh Ken kendry won pro league finals so kendry's played there before True, but Kenny's um, not Oh, no, sorry, Kenny's, Kenny's left corner. Sorry. Yeah, he's on yeah, secret. He's not yeah. there anymore. <laughs> what timeline are you in, living I'm, in? I'm living in the, in, in the six months in the past. I was um, like, boy. what about? No, no, you, you're damn right. I think everyone would have struggled. It would have been their first event, and it would have been um, quite a lot, really, to, to undertake. So, like you say, the, the experience that Vitality were able to bring there. Anything else about Group B before we move on, gentlemen? I mean, we're not DZ. going to talk about team we're, one, I mean, so. <laughs> I, I, I've talked about DZ. Where did DZ yeah. go from this? Like, that, that's where do DZ yeah. go from here? DZ have been struggling all stage. Yeah. I mean, if they make another roster move, this is like the ninth roster move they've made, like, in a row. Like, uh, this team's made so many moves. And, like, I don't know if they need one or not. It kind of feels like they do. But at the same time, I just want them to stick with something, right? Like, ever since Hot and Cold left, this team's been nothing but shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. It's always somebody leaving. It's always somebody new coming in. The coaches got involved. Like, it's ridiculous how often this team's been changing over the last few months. So, I like the lineup they have. Maybe they've got to do more role swapping. They tried that here. Uh, it didn't really work. Maybe they got to try some, some more combinations. Um, they've got, from now until I decide to figure it out, I guess they have the U.S. Finals as well. So, they can't make a roster move until then. After SI, we'll make a more, I think, definitive uh, decision. But right now, oh boy. Yeah, they need some work for sure. When they added Skies and Eclipse, it took them, I think, like two to three months to really get feet under them with how that squad was going to perform. And it was also like a two-man move, so everyone kind of gave it more grace before it, it, it had any fruit to bear. And then when they added NJR, it was kind of the same thing because they didn't know how to use NJR for literally like three months until they said, okay, second entry is not the, not the place you need to go. We'll give you a flex. We'll put you on smoke and we'll make it work from there. So the fact that you're coming and replacing an IGL is such a massive deal. And this team has kind of been in a, in a weird spot without Mint. Still made two majors though, like which that should be commended. But yeah, I'm going to give this plenty of room for Dark Zero to do anything because... What they tried at this major was cool. 
it it was it was most of it was abysmal in overall performance in the way that Canadian decided to conduct that roster. So hopefully it doesn't rear its ugly head again. Yeah. All right, team team one, Ollie. Let us go on unload. What are what are you gonna say? Go on. Yeah, what you got? I mean, what do you want to know? What do you want? The the thing is, let's be honest. Like, that's not an easy group to be in if you're Dark Zero. Like, you've got a lot of unpredictable teams in there. You've got Team One. You've got. You're not going to come out of that group alive as DZ. I just don't think, and I think that a lot of teams would, a lot of NA teams certainly, with the structure that they try and bring, would struggle to be able to come out alive out, outside of that group. Um, but they, you know, there's a lot of expectation from from Team One now. They've got to prove that they're not the one trick wonder from mexico if you think back to how they got through to mexico you think there was the tiebreaker there was all that excitement there was all of that you know very fine margin and chance of them even making it into the finals and they did and then they go and win it it's not a repeatable way to get there and i think they've proved that here and now they've got through clear as they like out of the groups they could not have done any better to get themselves into the playoffs so again it's just furthering it's just proving that they've uh, that they've really got what it takes yeah, I didn't have any reason to think Team 1 weren't going to make it out. Uh, though the concept of betting heavy on the favorite from SI into Mexico and thinking that NIP were going to make it out made me, and I think, like slightly skeptical about how it would go this yeah. time. Um, because, like, someone mentioned something, or I saw it, some record about the team that wins uh, one major or premier event, so usually majors or SI. So whenever that happens, the team that wins it then usually makes it out of groups but then doesn't do anything else after that like they might go to quarters and then get knocked out like because there's, there's just some other team that kind of has their number because they put a target on their back when they won mexico and everyone's yeah. like how right. how do we adapt around this but they still got second in copa lead even if they didn't have to try super hard in stage three right mm. the there's current only been one stat. team that's done that to be fair and that's g2 yeah and okay there we go they, they will be they will be the only team to to repeatedly do it i think i don't think that it's I don't think the legacies are a thing anymore. Like you mentioned, uh, one of Julio's sort of comments off the back of Mexico was that we just felt like everyone had prepped them because it's like, oh my goodness, we're in NIP's group. We've got to just, let's just VOD review these guys. Let's just focus 100% on these because these are the ones to beat. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden they get beat because there's only so much that you can realistically do. And it's nice now to see, I mean, let's be honest, NIP sandbagged the whole stage of BR6. Like, yeah. 100%. That is that is a factual statement, and it's it just is one of those things. The structure and the way that the BR6 runs, for anyone that's unfamiliar, it's a cumulative standing, so it means that stage one, two, and three all add up with each other. So there's no real worry of getting relegated in stage three if you've done really well in stages one and two. And that's pretty much exactly what we saw happen. And it, it happens, it's very circular. You know, the teams that, that get at the top quickly... They're very capable of just going, eh, we don't really need to do all too much here. The exception to that rule, I will say this, are two teams, Phase and Liquid, consistently in, in that number one and number two spot, but it's because they put the work in week after week. So there's 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 possibilities to sandbag, there's possibilities to save strats, there's possibilities to really keep things hidden, um, but a couple of teams really haven't done that. But NIP, I believe, were one of those teams that did, and at least it shows at the major at the moment because they've not done too bad in the group. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm I so, then, surprised. Uh, so surprised. It, talking about NIP, then I guess we can kind of sit, like segue into Group C and talk about how right. they were undefeated up until that very final game against BDS, and they could have been the only team of any of the premier events in Rainbow Six so far for 2021 to get an undefeated group stage, but everyone has always kind of fallen short of the mark. Liquid could have done it in Mexico. I think uh, Empire or BDS were 8-1, and one, respectively, at SI, but no team's been able to do it successfully so far, so 15 points is the max anyone's been able to get. And BDS in second. This was uh, where that head-to-head -head matchup where they kind of screwed them over, and BDS, the fact that Sonics took them to overtime yesterday, they, I think it, it would have come down to that round tiebreaker as opposed to the head-to-head, -head because bds and nip both beat or had a, in two games went one and one against one another so the fact that sonics uh forced bds to not have a clean or like every game in ot meant that uh they're in second nip's in first and this means that every single latin american team that we had at this major were number one seeds as opposed to anyone being a number two yeah if uh if sonics had not pushed that game to overtime bds would be at one extra point they'd be tied in ip for 15 points each they'd be tied in the head-to-head -head because each team um 
beat their, or they beat each other in regulation both times. They'd be high. They'd be tied in the head-to-head of round count because both games were seven four. So we'd go to the third tiebreaker, which is overall round difference, which would go to BDS because they're at plus seventeen. They'd be a little bit higher, plus eighteen, plus nineteen if they beat Sonics. And NIP would be a plus thirteen. However, I would make the argument that if that game had all that on the line, that last matchup between BDS and NIP maybe would have gone differently. That both teams walked into that game knowing it was completely irrelevant and. You know, I don't, I don't want to say they definitely played like it, but I think we probably would have seen a little bit more effort, a little bit more strats, a little bit more creativity coming out from both teams, perhaps if that had been uh, having a little bit more on the line. Yeah, I think you're right, especially when you look at the map that was played. Villa it yeah. used to be a stronghold for NIP, and since it's just become a little bit of a throwaway map. Um, and again, they're not afraid to admit that they put the effort into the games that mean something and the games that matter. Um, and let's be honest, the only reason that the Sonics BDS game went to overtime was because it was Tim and Des casting it. And that's all <laughs> they seem to attract. <laughs> they love a good overtime game to them two boys. Um, jokes aside, obviously, it was it was certainly a close one. I was that's one of the few games that I actually caught and I caught the end of it as well. Um yeah. but yeah. I, I was I was pleasantly surprised, I guess, in that game by the Sonics, but it's again it comes down to that depth, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and NIP for me, I had no real expectations of them coming into this event. I know Ollie was like, oh, you know, they're, they're count them out. you know, sandbag and all this stuff. I mean, whenever I watch them play during the 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 uh, the, C, the split free of uh, of Latam, I mean, sure you can sit there and say hide and strats, but mechanically and like the basic stuff of Siege, they just weren't doing it right. So for me, it was just, I don't think they were hiding stuff. I just think they were genuinely bad. That, that's just mode. my understanding. Yeah. And sure, they managed to, to get into the Cup Elite Six Finals, where they beat a very bad, on the day, a very bad Liquid side who did not show up at all. And then they went the next day, got absolutely smashed by Team 1. I was like, okay, sure, they've made it through. But if they come up against a half-decent side, they're going to go back to the same ways. They're not going to do anything. But they've actually been able to, to show up, which I, I'm so surprised. I thought they were going to be the Mickey Mouse team, you know, the Disneyland team where they're living in a fantasy. Um, but somehow they managed to pull off a blinder of a grip stage. Um, but I think a lot of it came down to how they started things off with their momentum on the first day. Uh, that first game they had against Invictus. Invictus were 5-4 up, and I thought Invictus were actually going to win that game. Invictus looked same, so, yeah. They looked mm-hmm. so good to win that, that first game. game. Wasn't it? And that could have changed the entire course of that group for all we know. So, yeah, stuff like that, you know, m- margins we're dealing with for NIP, but all credit to them. I am proud of how Invictus played overall, just for the whole tournament, in spite of not mm-hmm. having uh, any wins up until the very last day. I did think that that game against NIP was going to be one that they won. Speakeasy was having a great tournament. I think he earned MVP honors after the first day of groups because of how he played in those first two matchups. Uh, yeah. and, and, and both of them were losses, which I still kind of thought was funny. But it was how they incorporated Gig that's uh, still impressed me. Obviously, Gig... I didn't think was going to be a slouch and I, I i like corrected a lot of people that were saying oh there's no way gig can really contribute anything to this team but he absolutely did he slotted into that sludge role i think decently well um in place of hysterics on attack and then the only time he ever did something that wasn't uh kind of flexing around or being the utilitarian for ig was i think in that last uh game on bank he was hard sticking the echo that was like the only real thing like they played structured they didn't do what oxg did and kind of threw the towel in to start with they played more into it, their game plan as much as they possibly could. And it's still like, like this is a game or a tournament where they can still get a lot of valuable experience mm-hmm. in spite of not having hysterics. They should feel good about how they did despite being yeah. last in the group. Yeah, making the best mm-hmm. out of worst situation, which is completely what Invictus did. And to be fair, I, I thought they might have been able to, you know, shithouse a few more victories, I'll be honest, just because of the unpredictableness. Sure. Um, but it just wasn't meant to be. So yeah, I, I do feel quite sorry for Invictus. I thought they would have at least been third. I didn't expect them to be mm-hmm. bottom last of the group. Mm. Yeah, especially like one of their players tweeted at some point as well that like they didn't feel like a lot of their issues were because of the fact they had to play with a coach. And I agree, like Gig played pretty well. You know, not the best player ever, but like solid. I don't think he was throwing a bunch of rounds. Certainly, I think he had more of an impact than Hopes did. And so like, yeah, it felt like some of their issues were more were like beyond that, right? So it's definitely disappointing to see that like, they still didn't, uh, I, I mean, it was a very tough group, right? They probably weren't going to make it out. But for what they did, I think they can be proud. And uh, I agree, lots to, lot to work on there and lots to learn. Jesse, I have an idea about what you're going to say when I ask you this, but what was your opinion of the Sonics? 
This is funny. I think like Sonic's had uh Sonic's had some good games, right? Like Sonic started off the day. That game against BDS didn't end up great, but like I thought they played better than the scoreline pro um, performed or showed. Sure. Their NIP game was tough, right? They beat IG great. Um they lost to BDS. I didn't watch that game, but you know, going to overtime with BS was great. Then the last day, uh, they lose to NIP, another very close game, and their last match doesn't matter, but they lose to Invictus. Um, I thought they played okay, um, but I do have to echo somebody. I'm not going to name who this was, um, but another analyst sort of in the scene messaged me because Super, I think, tweeted right after the uh, right after the last game ended, right after the third game ended, right where when they played against uh, when they played against NIP, right? I don't think I saw and this Super, tweet, but okay. Super just said, like, really happy with how we played. We showed we're a dominant force in the international scene. You know, uh, we're really good. Something like that, right? And it was pointed out to me that Sonics have won, like, two games across both majors. They got two points in Mexico. They got four whole points in Group C here in uh, in Sweden. At least looking just at the results, Sonics have not put up great international performances at all. And you can't ignore that, I would say, if you're SQ. They have had uh, really bad results, whether that's because, you know, they're getting stomped on or because they're losing seven fives or eight sixes. The other day, it doesn't really matter, right? And if I'm the Sonics, I think I'm going home and I'm thinking, well, maybe we do need to fix something, right? Not necessarily a roster move, but like maybe we've got to work on something. Maybe there's a more fundamental problem. Maybe we just need to uh, to make some changes here. So I don't think you're that happy if you're the Sonics. Um, they may talk like they are, and they may, you know, think that they're a top team, um, and maybe they are. But certainly, these results over two majors now don't seem to suggest it. I want them to be a good. hard group. Let's be honest. Sure. BDS again for them, like that's both times that have been. Yeah. Good. BDS <laughs> like first in Euro UL, like the NIP, a tournament team. You could have put more, many NA teams in there, and the I think the standings would have probably been the same. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, but I think Even like SSG, but I, I think agree, would've, would've but, but, but I do agree group. with what you're saying, Jesse, and I think that regardless of the quality that's inside of your group, you've got to be able to come out and put in a put in a show and put in a performance, and and maybe that's where we're not. I mean, I didn't watch every single game, so I, I might be speaking a little bit out of turn here, but already you can see like a couple of seven twos creeping in there, like they're not competitive games. Not as competitive as I'd like, especially not as competitive as the score lines they were putting up in the NAL either. So it, it's it's more proof that like a team like Space Station has been capable of translating what they do in the NAL to something internationally because they've made it out of both groups at both majors at this point. Um, and they survived the group of death, which is the point that I wanted to lead into now, because I'm going to say it straight up. This group was probably the hands down most entertaining group we've probably ever had in Siege history. Obviously, it's best of ones. We're not dealing with a double GSL style, so it's very clearly the best uh, double round robin best of one group that we've ever seen in Siege history, but for the love of God, can we have this again? Because the games that we had here, there probably wasn't a single game here that wasn't entertaining or had a decent storyline going into it. And Empire are that their streak of making it out of groups into playoffs for every single premier event that they've been in has finally been snapped. Jacob, can can I tell you of the tale of the major curse? <laughs> every sure. team. And it's a small sample size. We've only had three majors. But so far, every team that has won a major has then gotten second at the next major. G2 got first at uh, in Paris, second at Raleigh. Empire first at Raleigh, second in Mexico. Team won first in Mexico. Who knows when we get to Sweden? But it gets deeper than that. Because every team that gets second, and therefore the year before got first, goes out in groups. EG got second in Paris. They're out in groups at Raleigh. G2, second at Raleigh, out in groups in Mexico. Uh, Empire, second in Mexico, out in groups in Sweden. This is all fourth hold. And thus, we can not only say, of course, Empire went out in groups. This was, you know, written out beforehand. But also, Team 1 are uh, unfortunately going to be stuck in second place this time. And it's only getting worse from here. <laughs> so what you're telling me, Jesse, is we could make a lot of money betting on this. If yes, this stack formula, that cash. And an algorithm that you've come up with that's going to work. We can predict <laughs> future majors. That's exactly what I'm saying. I Not actually first places, but we can predict second places. Exactly. So when Dan One Kia win this one, they're going to get second next time around. Great, cool. Yes, exactly. Why did you? You literally spoiled every single event for the next couple of years on us, Jesse. Thank you so well, much. Well, it doesn't apply to SI, so SI can still be fun. Okay. You know? <laughs> Head up. We've still got one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, and man. it doesn't say the next. The world winner, championship right? is sacred. And that's all. There you go. 
What do we have in the script that I really, really liked? Other, okay, so yeah, Empire not making it is a big blow. Uh, your boys, Ollie, Furia, talk to me. Why? Why did they not drone in that last game, man? I was frauds. Sad. I thought they'd do better. They're than frauds, this. Jacob. They're fraudulent. That's right. So, are. so demo was messaging me, telling me that Furia are going to go home and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, he, he was right. I think, you know, you put it really well. Pengu summed it up beautifully on the stream, and it was it was a it was a cafe game. I think it might have been the second SSG one that they played, and he summed up fantasy perfectly. He said, fancy is always trying to be the hero. And if he's not the hero, he ends up being the villain. And he doesn't need to be either. He just needs to be a citizen. They're not my words. They're Pengu's words. And I thought it was beautiful. Do your job. Just just do your job. And don't try and make it happen. It runs a little bit deeper. I was looking at some of the ratings for the players. Um, and it's no real surprise to see that there's a couple of Furia players there that are pretty dreadful in the ratings we're talking like zero seven seven zero lender especially it was like a liability today yeah i wasn't going to name any names jacob but yeah <laughs> lender didn't play very it. well um no and it, it, it needs calling out when you see it it's, it's good to see that rare had a good shift in you know the support i've always rated rare as a great player um i've always rated a lot of the supports inside of latam i think that's the foundation of a lot of these good teams that we're seeing and a lot of the results that they're getting at the moment you think about phase you think about souls like those you know he's so much work for phase uh and and fury is very much the same but you can't rely on fantasy just every single time and let's be honest i think that highs let miracle and lender they have dropped off a little bit like we haven't seen that consistency top through bottom now the same way that we did at si the same way that we did inside of mexico even inside of stage three Fury were a little bit hit or miss. If Fancy wasn't showing up, then it was a little bit of a problem. And I don't know where they where they go from that. They're still a very young side, and it's it's maybe sounds like we're being a bit harsh on them here. This is the third major event that they've been to, and it's only the mm -hmm. first time they're not making it out of groups. Can I ask you a question as well, uh, Ollie? Because for me, like, yeah, I was, I've been talking with sort of my watch party about Furia, and obviously, like, Fancy is kind of the highlight player, but I've always felt that Miracle is, like, the backbone of this team. It's, mm. like, always showing up, always, like, clutching up on support. Do you feel he performed adequately this result? I mean, obviously, his stats weren't amazing, but as a support no. player, they never are. How do you feel about him? It's, it's tricky because Rare also shares a lot of that supporting role as well. So they kind of do sort of flex off the back of one another and i don't know what it is about miracle highs and lender at the moment they'll have the odd good round here and there but there isn't that consistency across the board and i don't know if it's because they're spending too much time trying to drone fancy and or, or whatever the the case might be whether they are just getting entirely wrapped up in that non-trackable statistic that we like to call support um which is obviously a lot broader than the term but yeah, they've certainly not had the impact I think that they've that they've required. And maybe maybe they're getting to a point now where don't forget, Furious saw a lot of success at SI. A lot of teams will have gone into that and will have gone, "Who's this? Like, do we prep against you? Do we not prep against you? Like, who who are you guys? Do you know what I mean?" And then as soon as you start getting known, as soon as you get gain a little bit of notoriety, things aren't as easy. Things aren't just mm. you know, here you go, fancy have four kills. Like we know who this guy is, and we're not going to do it that <laughs> do, do it that way again. Yeah, for, for me, Fury feels that they're still trying to figure out what kind of team they are, because I don't even know yeah. what they are. I don't know their, their tactics. I don't know the strategy behind how they're playing. It just seems that somebody said, you know, oh, mum, can, can we get team one on the way home? No, we have, we have team one at home. <laughs> and then you open the fridge, and Fury is sitting there. And you're like, what, what is this? Uh, and yeah, I, I just think Fury just... I don't know, it looks as if they've changed things since the last major, and I don't know why. Yeah. Um, it looks as if maybe something's happened where they feel as if they need to prove themselves even more. Um, I, I think Fura played extremely well as an underdog. It's a team that nobody really expected anything off, and they played their hearts out, and they caused the upsets. And now they've got to the stage where everyone expects big swing from. I would say there's a good chunk of people who would actually have said Fury to get out of this group just because of how well they have been sure. playing. And maybe that pressure got to them. Maybe the fact that they have to live up them, those expectations, it's just kind of crumbled. 
I would have had them getting out of this group, or I would have had them qualifying for playoffs if they were in like any other group. If you put them into A, B, or C, uh, there's a very good chance that they do, but just because of the, the caliber of opponents that they had in Group D, that made me think that there really wasn't an opportunity for them to qualify. And I did think Empire was going to get out, but the team I do want to mention real quick is Space Station, just for one prime fact. They were the only team, I think, through all of groups. I'm sorting my CGG stats by, by 1VXs. They were the only team that had multiple players get at minimum two one vxs this is probably one of the most clutch teams we've ever seen they had what was it bosco had four fultz had three hot and cold had two rampy had two skies was the only Jeez. one who didn't have a one vx clutch they blew every other team out of the water in that statistic so if they're down bad in any scenario it seems like someone is capable of clutching up i do think someone in chat mentioned that yeah g2 probably being more clutch that's fair i'm talking about in the context of this major because for the love of god they needed to dig deep and activate like a sixth gear so to speak if they were in trouble one player is capable of turning an entire round on its head we obviously looked at the first empire game uh on villa from two days ago as a prime example like fultz and rampy pulled two crazy clutches back to back in the first two rounds and then they went and played empire on villa later today and it was much the same story so for like space station look damn good for being a second seed mm -hmm. i don't know if i want to see space station gaming come into this group and rely so much on clutches as they I'm, did i don't know if i want to you either. said that like yeah i don't i never think that a 1vx is a great stat line to be good at as a team like sure it's nice but that's that's a lot of opportunity yeah, see, that you may not have been sat in second seed i'll i'll counter that right because yes i get the, the understanding of you know clutches it's not reliable it's uh it shows that you're not playing clean siege it's messy i think nip whenever they want invite how many clutches do they have it was a messy messy team they were scrapping rounds out they never looked, you know, they, they never looked, I, for me, during invite, NIP never looked, like, really, really good. But they were still winning rounds, they were still winning games. Um, unlike, you know, look at a team like BDS or, you know, Old Liquid. You think I polished those teams where, you know, you know that, that is pristine mm -hmm. siege. Whereas NIP, they were muddy. You know, they they were just, all hell was, was breaking loose, but they are winning the rounds. And sure, I, I get what you mean, but still, if you're winning the rounds, you're winning the rounds. I don't think people care how you're winning them as long as you're winning. that That's the main thing that matters. And if SSG want to go down that let's just clutch everything, they'll win. And they will win the tournament because of that. NIP did it. There's the proven theory behind it. Yeah, everyone's going to forget about how atrocious their attacking sides were in uh, the group stage for the Six Invitational for NIP because they went and won the whole damn thing. So no one's going to yeah. go back and look at their group stage and be like, oh, well, they should have done this and this better. They still lifted the hammer at the end of the day. So the, the, there is some credence to that idea. That's just, it, it's it, it's a, a stat that, like, shouldn't exist, like, that highly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think Bosco was going to be the most clutch player out of anyone else here. There were some people who had three. I want to say Vertical had three 1VXs, but that's OXG, so it doesn't matter. Oh, Rare tied him. Rare had four. Rare. So, yeah. I mean, if <laughs> both of them it being in the same speaks to the group. group. Yeah, it honestly 100%. speaks to the group that they're in. You know, you look at that, and we probably it's probably time to talk about Dam one at this point as well, because we haven't mentioned these boys yet. But you're <laughs> in the group with furia with damn one with empire and you're gonna have to clutch like that one brought some exciting games did you see that last one yeah the, dude yeah um, kidding the clubhouse yeah that was so fun man like i loved watching furia and damn one play on clubhouse i could have honestly watched that all night not only because fury got the win and the thing that really like pleased me the most fury didn't need the win there because they were already going home it was yeah. pretty much locked in at that point it would have needed some team one shit to get them through to the playoffs at that point which just was never going to happen but it was great to see them play it was great to see them go out there and and damn one they've, they've got a really good shot here i think they're just a scary team you can't deal with them how do you deal with them demo they, they surprised me big time um <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think I put for Group D, I think I put SSG, and I think I put Furia uh, that come out of that Yeah, group. I did as well. Uh, I thought Empire, as good as they no looked No last during... time there at all. No, I, I just, you know, again, this is where I talked about living up the expectations of Fury, and everyone was saying, you know what, they've actually looked pretty good. Um, I, I think Empire, as good as they looked during Mexico, I don't think that luck was going to run uh, with them the whole entire time, just off the back of the EUL. Because, again, them even getting to this top four was... It was still up in the air for a good period of time. It wasn't if it was a done deal. It's not like, you know, look at BDS. You knew they were they were in the spot, you know, before anyone else. Um, 
But th this, you know, this Korean side for me, what they've been able to do in the past what, six months has been incredible. I, I don't think there's been another team which has had this run of consistency for being so new. It, it's yeah. it is insane. It, it's unheard of. And um, wow. I, where, team where one you... maybe. Okay, fair enough with team one. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, but then again, team one started off kind of in like you know the, the trenches. This you know that team one team was was made last year, and it was. You know, sure. a bit of a ragtag group of people and was like, oh, start off rough and then eventually got good. But, I mean, this damn one side, just the dominant effect that they've had. And I think, obviously, yes, I know you can say Team 1, but from APAC, the region that is supposed to be, yeah, they're not even here. Like, they, Don't worry about APAC, they're just here to mm -hmm. fill up the spots. But no, they've completely changed what people say about APAC, and yeah, I, I just cannot wait to see where this team's going to go. It's it's crazy, not even just because like it seems like like first of all it's Apex rise, right? Like I think this is the strongest APAC has ever looked in the history of Rainbow Six, which is like really, really good at this event. They're crushing it. But not only that, it's the Korean side of APAC, right? And Korea, you know, for all the uh, accolades they have throughout video games and esports, they've always been pretty terrible at Rainbow Six. Like, sure, this sandbox core back in the day, they've always been there, but it's usually been Japan, sometimes Australia, sometimes this uh, Invictus core as well, right? Korea, I feel like, always has been one of the weakest, if not the weakest, APAC region. And for them to now have two teams, and not just two teams in the playoffs, but two teams, I'd argue, are very different in terms of their play styles. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dam one can be very aggressive, can be very fast. Sandbox, I think, are a little bit slower. They can play more strategic siege. You know, it's crazy to see. And I'm wondering if this is the future. You know, give it a couple of years, maybe we're just League of Legends where nobody wins except for the Koreans. <laughs> yeah, the only FPS that I think I can remember Korea being really good at is Overwatch. Like CS, they don't well, really yes. have anything that works there i mean because obviously like overwatch plays very different to most other, other fps games but i love that we're seeing a region that for a long time has been discredited or kind of underdeveloped get this kind of spotlight and the fact that it's damn one who weren't the established team for a really long time like sandbox are coming into the fold after damn one made quarterfinals in mexico so it's it, there's two of them happening uh in tandem simultaneously which for me is really cool um but one of them has to eliminate the other so the thing you mentioned about in playoffs one of them going through means that whoever does is is going to be proven to be the strongest Korean team like overall like there is a <laughs> like a definitive contest there's no way out of it so I'm I'm personally hoping for damn one because I loved them when I saw them play in Mexico but I'm like we'll have to be cool with either one and I, I can't say I I dislike the notion of sandbox going to semis and that sandbox team has been around a while I mean like the, the core you know I think yeah. that team was what Mantis yeah. back in 2018 you know that's how far back this yeah. thing goes and they've, they've been around for for quite a while and i think you know during the time it was you know very new to see apac teams you know whenever Nora rango were there and they started kind of starting off their journey and then you had mantis the other team and you know i think it kind of got word you know i think i remember g2 saying oh you know these apac teams you know they're pretty good watch out for them stuff like that and there was a little bit of buzz around them and i think then it kind of fell off and then that's whenever fanatic kind of came in we seen fanatic and do what they did and then Nora just got strength to strength. And I think really for 2020, like 2019 going into 2020, APAC just kind of fell off, didn't they? I, I don't yeah. really think APAC were yes. discussing that's whenever LATAM yeah. kind of rose up and LATAM was the big talk of the town. Uh, and then obviously you guys in NA had, you know, that one victory, that just that singular victory. And um, we will ride that. Uh, we will. Yeah, you still are. You, you still are riding it. Uh -huh. and... The rest of the world had a year off. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and it's good to see that, that we've kind of came back now to the, the Korean yeah. side. You know, they kind of started things off and now we've came full circle. Yeah. And to, to point on that, the very first season that APAC was uh, involved and had a chance to qualify was season six of Pro League. Mantis FPS, which is this core, got number one in Korea and then number two in APAC. And they went to the finals, obviously, with that. I think they went out in quarters. Uh, yeah. yeah, they did. Um, but that, I mean, that team has barely changed. They still have Envy Taylor. They still have Static. Back in the day, he was known as Sweet Black. And they still have uh, Oni Chan slash OCN, who went from a player to a coach, but same team now. So it's incredible, their journey. All right, so we did have uh, Tango going and updating a couple stuff uh, for specific matches in the background. But uh, Jesse, do you want to run through all of them or just ones that you thought were like like half decent because most of the games that we had at like the back end of the day didn't matter for jack anything it was like the first half games yeah did in, in, in order to lock down who was going to playoffs and then like the the last ones for group d at the end of the day also mattered for something but there's like a four to five hour block of three games on both streams that were, was literally seeding and it didn't 
like lead to anything else substantial. So was there anyone that you wanted to talk about like specifically that we can dive into? My plan was once we got to those games that were were irrelevant, uh, I was just going to bitch about the format. So we can okay. skip them if you prefer. Uh, I don't have to go I on have, that I rant. I have like one point written for both of them, and there's more points written for like every other game because the games at the beginning of the, of the day still matter. So you just want to like run through it chronologically, and then like once we get there, we'll just get there. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. All right, sounds good. So like what we did for the last two days, Jesse took A stream, I took B stream. So which game did you start with? I started with Team 1 versus Dark Zero. This was, you know, okay, yesterday on the post show, Jacob, we talked about our expectations, and I said, I got some hopium for DZ. I think they can make a comeback. Their last game of the day, it looked pretty good. 7-1 over Vitality. This is the comeback, and Team 1 shut that down as soon as I woke up. 7-1 uh, victory for Team 1. Dark Zero, I think, had to win this uh, in order to have a chance of... Uh, of making it through to the bracket and damn that was uh that was really bad dz looked super panicked on defense they were scrambling during some of these pushes and really struggling to win uh anything throughout that first half team won won every fight it was just a fink a pop and then they were in and then it was over we got to see two attacking rounds from dark zero very slow very hesitant rounds again they looked panicked they looked scared alamal swung on everything um even as smoke but he's so much better than everybody on Dark Zero that it didn't actually matter, and he just won all of his gunfights. So, yeah, this was uh, this was a five-one starting half for Team One on Oregon. If that doesn't tell you about this game, I don't know what will. He's had a good major. Uh, you got him out playing anyway. Blitz. Yeah, current MVP. Blitz? No, I don't think he touched Blitz. He usually likes to troll on Blitz on Oregon. Any Ella? Surely there has to be a bit Ella. Yes, in there. A bit of Ella. Yeah, yeah there was some Ella. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. That's a bit of a signature weapon for him, but I mean mm. that—that's that, the kind of guy you want hit hitting the form, don't you? If you're team one, you want you know your your personality, your face. You want that player hitting his shots, hitting his stride, and he's he's gonna be he's gonna be tricky. He's gonna be very very tricky for uh, for Rogue to take down. Uh, I think you could say in many instances that if Alamau shows up against Rogue, what do Rogue do? You know what are you gonna do <laughs> against that guy? The team's so deep. It's much deeper than just Alamau as well. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah. This 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 came up at a good time actually, um, to sort of start talking about that. It's not even a contest. You don't even need yeah. to know anything about numbers or seeds to know that that was not even a game <laughs> worth rewatching. Green versus red, big numbers versus little numbers. Yeah. Everyone had positive KDs. Most of them were were two point oh or above, with the exception of Alamau. Funnily enough. Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's such a massive discrepancy like did dark zero even try to do anything that was like <laughs> like different from the standard that they'd set over the past couple of days or was it troy doing the same flex thing that he'd always done eclipse i see was playing hard support again like yeah they just didn't well, seem like it, it didn't seem like they showed up yeah i mean it was pretty much the same dark zero we've seen right they haven't been changing their roles around they really stuck with what they have and, and honestly i can respect that even for all the shit that people give them from the roles you know mm -hmm. I, I i do think that there is something there if they can you know work on it a little bit more it just yeah it felt like team one were playing so fast they hit them so hard the holds were very um just passive holding things down with a bunch of utility it's oregon so you expect that but there was really nothing crazy from what I saw in terms of the strats of Dark Zero, it felt like they just played a very kind of, you know, default almost uh, heavy um, Oregon. The one thing that was really weird was their site rotation. They went dining, dorms, laundry, dorms, meeting, laundry, which is very <laughs> odd. Um, they, they didn't try laundry until round three. Uh, and they tried it again around six. The only round they won was their second dorms defense. Um, so that was a little weird. Um, maybe to try to throw them off, but... You know, certainly nothing to uh, nothing to write down in your strat book. I went back and did a check, by the way, of Team One's overall head-to-head -head history against Dark Zero. Um, it's five maps to none overall for Team One over DZ, and it's six maps to none if you want to count the one time that the old Team One roster beat them at the Allied Esports Minor <laughs> in Vegas. That was a seven-four. So Team One against Dark Zero, Org versus Org, if nothing else, has been all Team One, all Brazil the entire time. Uh, 
I, I really, really feel for the guys on Dark Zero, but ultimately I do still think if they get more time to figure out what their roles and how their team is going to shape up, there's, they've been I, the Identity Crisis team in North America literally all year, and that didn't change here because they were trying some things that very clearly, um, if they had more time to flesh it out, might have found success, but it simply wasn't, it wasn't to be here. So get the purple guys off our screens. We'll see them at the NA Finals, though, because they made this major, so we will see them there over TSM. So maybe something there will be different, but I'm not sure. We'll see. For me, I had Vitality Sandbox starting off the day, which was super pivotal because this was back when both of them were still tied in points. If Well, no matter which team won this, they were going to be uh, super, super close to qualifying. Um, but Sandbox needed to get the relegation or the regulation victory to qualify outright, and Vitality were still going to be behind in tiebreaker, so it would have required some more things to happen uh, through Group B as the day progressed. But Sandbox won 7 1. This was a slaughter. And the bans for Sandbox uh, were a little bit funky. Um, they <laughs> were, they meant that Maestro couldn't be utilized anywhere, and this was a problem because Sandbox attacks were just so good. Vitality try to roam round one, like because it's Oregon. You're never not going to roam. It failed really early, and then what they started doing was playing offside positions, and they'd freeze up. They weren't, you know, very progressive. They weren't moving around the map very frequently. They would like hold one guy in kids. He'd hold the position above kitchen, and B Taylor would just go up and shoot him because he wouldn't leave kids. Nobody was moving around on the roam after like the first round because it got shut down so effectively by sandbox. So I don't know if in their mind they were like, yeah, we'll just. Uh, We'll we'll go to one spot and then stay still because it's easier to shoot a, like a, a non-moving target than a moving target. And Sandbox made it work. Um, on attack, we had another 100% opening pick conversion rate. So Jesse creaming in his pants over that stat. Um, and then the thing that was a little curious for me was Vitality were down really bad on an Oregon defense, which normally for both like europe and apac doesn't happen it's still defender sided and lyloon doesn't call a timeout until it's 6-1 match point like they were down they had tried like two or i think a dorm site twice it was 3-0 4-0 the score kept getting worse and worse and they didn't call a timeout to do anything to reset and i talked to helby about it after the fact and he said the errors that vitality were having were things that couldn't be fixed with a timeout so and obviously he wasn't there like in comms, so he couldn't quite hear exactly what was going on and it like wasn't his decision to make. But I, I kept thinking they're down really terribly and nothing about their defenses has been stellar. They've been outplayed every time because Sandbox is just that good of an attacking team. And there wasn't a timeout utilized until it was quite literally too late. I kind of have a thing if you use a TO and there's only like one round of leeway left and you mm -hmm. use it on match point, that that's mm. quite clearly too late. But uh, yeah, Sandbox got this and they qualified in the second place spot as a result. I think that's touching it. on that timeout thing, that's been a theme of the major as a whole. I think there's a lot of teams that have been taking them either too late or just not at all. And I think Dark Zero is a team that springs to mind in that fact. And, and a couple of others out there that have just really been... You know, like, why wait until match point to call the timeout? You're just giving the opportunity to your opponents to figure their shit out as well. Like, keep the it, momentum it really rolling. Yeah, exactly. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I feel like that's something we see a lot. Like, even Space Station, like, tends to call pretty late timeouts. Not match point late, I would say, for SSG, but, like, they're not a team that like to call it after two or three rounds, which we do see occasionally from some teams as well. I think Damwon called theirs uh, relatively early today. Dark Zero actually, to, to counteract your point a little bit, did call its act. Oh no, I'm I'm reading my notes wrong. Dark Zero didn't call attack timeout at all in that game. Sandbox called attack timeout after two rounds. Got it. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's interesting. Um, I wonder what type of like issues they could have been. Uh, they could have been talking about that like aren't going to be fixed by attack timeout. I think it's a lot of teams see it as like a bit of weakness. I think I'm maybe like digging in too deep to the mental here, but I've. I've got a sneaking suspicion that teams are like, oh, if we take a timeout, it's because we're weak. Like, we can't figure this out on the fly. And uh, sometimes it's just, you've got to be like, you know, it, maybe maybe to keep confidence high and to keep morale high, it's like, now nah, we won't take timeout, we don't need to sort of thing. But maybe yeah. there's, there's, a, there's an argument to say that there's sometimes when maybe probably should. That's something I think uh, if if I ever had the opportunity to like ask Pengu, hey, what's the philosophy behind taking timeouts? He's somebody who would definitely know like more than anyone else here. Uh, Tango, I did have a replay that I, I wanted to mention as well, which I kind of thought was interesting and was showcasing uh, just like this is a very structured Korean team, whereas 
by comparison, a team like Damwon is very they can be way more explosive. And that was the attribute that I liked about them before they qualified for Mexico to start with is that um, Yas is like, like phenomenal. He will pre-fire every angle known to man. Uh, Rin is a little bit kind of off the chain in some moments, but a team like Sandbox has historically been a team that can play a little bit anti APAC in some ways. They can get frisky like APAC t- like tends to do, but they will usually be someone who can play more slow and structured. And this round, I think, was kind of an example of that. So Vitality is peaking some weird stuff. We're downstairs. We're defending on meeting. But what they're going to do is Sandbox recognize that there's uh, an, a gap in this defense because everyone's kind of off-site. So what they do is they come in, they plant meeting because they come back around the stage doorway. But then you'll notice Bandit P4 comes up and he not only knocks out the planter, but he also kills the cover. So that same route is actually where their retake strategy was, uh, was going to try to plant its foot as much as they possibly could so they uh when sandbox come in through that same spot p4 comes back and stops the plant so i thought this was where vitality was going to get their first round turned out not to be the case because envy taylor's he, he's gonna like laser focus tunnel vision hunt down shinka so now he's gone p4 still has a power position because of what like where he just sits in the corner but envy taylor's just so good and wins the round outright for vitality or uh, sorry for sandbox and i'm just like there was there was a hole you saw the gap you used it pretty well but i that should have been around the vitality one and sandbox it's almost like they have a sixth sense when it comes to their offensive strategies and making sure that they like keep calm under pressure so when they play that game against damn one i'm going to be super super impressed all right well um following that game jacob I at least got something that wasn't quite a 7-1. Um, it was a little bit longer. It went 15 rounds. And mm-hmm. if this isn't the, the definition of Omega Lull, I don't know what is. <laughs> Rogue versus Auction Esports. All you have to do, Rogue, to secure first seed in your group is beat this garbage team that's not even trying, that doesn't have their five stack, and you lose it. 8-7. My man. God. They had to win in regulation to secure down uh, top seed. But... This was hilarious. We started off with auction uh, on defense on cafe. Roger Ban and Blackbeard. They're like, this game's a joke, right? <laughs> Kino, I believe. Was it Kino or was it Yaga yesterday? Oh, uh, it was Yaga. Blackbeard. Yeah. Yago's rocking the Blackbeard, so that's like where that band comes from, <laughs> right? But they were just like kind of trolling. And Auction started, and they're playing pretty aggressively. Um, you can tell that they're having a lot of fun with their uh with their holds. Um, and I, I would say auction or sorry, not auction, Rogue took it maybe a little bit lazily. Like, they weren't trading at any, uh, at all. They were pushing very one at a time. You know, they weren't full clearing generally that very first round. It was kitchen defense, and they just, like, take the, the take the main floor, try to take through lobby. They never ended up getting uh, uh, that top floor control. So it seemed like it was a little bit questionable. Um, and then, like, to end off the half, right, it was going back and forth, right, because Rogue were still fighting back at this point. To end off the half, it's a it's a mining defense. Oxygen went contested, so they let the site go random, uh, and it went mining, right? <laughs> Yaga's playing on Tachanka uh, inside piano, claps two people on the windows of, like, uh, on the windows slash inside a cigar, and then hopes and vertical clutch up in the 2v2. Crazy frags. I didn't get the clip. Another round was the round right before it, where Rogue had tied it up once again. It's a kitchen hold once again, and vertical pushes. Vertical's in a 1v2. He pushes out of the bakery doorway where they're both outside and slaps them both because they weren't expecting him to do like such a dumb play. <laughs> and that was kind of the whole game, right? The second half was a lot more like restrained. Oxygen kind of played like pretty default attacking operators. Um, obviously, the Black Bear was banned out, so they couldn't play that. <laughs> but um, they had pretty solid takes, I would say. Rogue were really crumbling. Um they had some big rounds in terms of their mechanical skill to clutch up. They were on they were against match point six three. They forced it to overtime, and then they threw once again as soon as they got to OT. Man, the first the first overtime Smug. round they won. They were up, what was it seven six? Then round fourteen, Yaga clutches a one v three, and round fifteen, Kino just gets two kills as they're like trying to crouch walk into the site through fireplace terrible game from rogue honestly kind of embarrassing um but hilarious as an na fan so this is really good for 
uh, T or just like NA fans in general, because what this ended up doing was putting Rogue into a number two spot, and now they have to play Team One, the reigning major champions, in their yeah. first game of the playoffs. So if you're hoping TSM are going to qualify uh, from the point system and not have to worry about the qualifier, thank OXG for being the possible savior if they end up losing that quarterfinal. So just this th this game was super pivotal, and OXG got a dub with hopes. Hope's got a pro league dub for the first time since his console days, I'm pretty sure. Yes, and well, he wasn't even playing Rainbow Six pro league. He played like Six Vegas, and I believe oh, yeah, he, played in a, he played in a show match before the game was like even out of beta or something. But yeah, you've got your stats here. Hope's maybe not the biggest player, but Vertical having a big game. Um, yeah, really hilarious game. I do recommend going back and watching that one. <laughs> Sweet. Was there uh, anyone, any other game that you, uh, the two of you looked at over like, because Demo, you so mentioned you didn't th this watch This is where I think I woke ones. up. So th this is yeah. where I think I woke up. Yeah. So okay, cool. this time, this Good. is where I've uh, awakened from the slumber. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I jumped straight into, I think, Fury of Damn 1. This is whenever I, mm. I kind of awoke and, and I started watching, watching that game, I believe. So, um, so yeah, that, that's... It was kind of opening games, like I said, didn't really get to watch it, which, again, like I said, haven't really got to watch Rogue, which is which is strange. You know, EU team, uh, you know, as much as Ollie, you know, he's kind of been brainwashed into LATAM, I'm still EU. You know, as much <laughs> as it is, I've enjoyed watching LATAM, I still stay true to what it is, still EU. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite sad I didn't really get to see much of them. Um, that Fury of Damn One game, if you want to dive into a little yeah, you bit. Yeah, do that. The, the BDS yeah, I, I jump into that. The, the BDS uh, uh, IG game that I had earlier on ended up just being like a stomp. I, don't I mean, these really are the games that didn't really matter, is it? Yeah. Well, well, this game didn't matter for much, yeah. yeah. Like, aside from seeding. So, yeah, we can totally talk about this one if you want. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Axe, you want to jump in on this? Because Fantasy didn't... Uh, I mean, he had a bit of an interesting game. Yeah, what did he do? He, um, so, he got he zero kills. to get a kill until, like, mm -hmm. the sixth or seventh round, didn't he? Yeah. Eighth. Eighth round. I was, was being his fine. first kill. <laughs> I got the numbers. Don't worry. Let me pull it up. Let me have a look. Because I, I yeah. think I caught the tail half of it. Do we have a stats so you, for this you game missed when you missed when Fantasy was absolutely doing nothing. Um, they banned out his... No, this was a different game I'm thinking of. They they just, I guess, shut him down. That first half, Rin and Yas were going crazy. Their adaptations yeah. were really, really good. They had nutty numbers. You can see them on your screen now, 15 and 15. A lot of that was the first half. Um, but... I mean, look at that stat line. It took eight rounds for Fantasy to find a kill, and look where he ended up. <laughs> wow, good God. He's still at 14. A, one, of the, one of the post plants from Furia was really shitty. Like, they got the plant down in a two versus two. They were tight on time, but we had... Oh, it might have been... The score might the have site? been a little bit something different. It was, it was Church and Arsenal. Okay, yeah. And... Oh, we God, saw yeah. Highs get himself up on the... He, he was in Kitchen on the book. The plant's gone down inside of Arsenal. The plant has died. Fantasy's in Generator. It's two versus two. All you got to do is stay alive. Fantasy dies in Generator. And then both the players, for damn one, run up the main stairs. But one of them doubles back. Highs had the call. He's sat in the corner. He's trying to watch onto the doorway. And the guy's underneath him defusing. He can't do anything about it because he's being held from the door. Tries to jump nah. down the hatch. Gets shot on the way. And it was like, it didn't matter because obviously Fury got the win anyway. But it just spoke to how scrappy but yet exciting the game was. I think Blue and Tim did a really good job on that one as well. I, I particularly yeah. enjoyed the cast. Mm -hmm. And like earlier on in that round, like to, to speak more on how scrappy it was, there was a Monty, right? Pushing for Fury. I don't remember who yeah. it was. Rare. Rare, Rare on Monty. Monty. Pushing down um, Dirt Tunnel, right? And the smoke on Damwon has put down a shield, right? And the smoke is just staring, and the, and the Monty can't yeah, get over the shield. Is, yeah. The Monty puts the shield on his back, whips yeah. out the pistol, vaults the shield, slams the smoke in the head, and continues to push down Dirt. Ridiculous shit from Rare. That was, like, maybe my favorite moment of the entire game. I'm going to go back and find the clip for that one, because when it happened, uh, I was looking away, and then I hear Ace just screaming about how crazy of a yeah. player that was with him both the <laughs> uh -huh. shot. And I'm just like, quick, hit the clip button, go back and watch it. Because, yeah, that was nutty. 
you, you, you just whenever Tim's cast in Fury, it's gonna you just something's gonna happen. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's never. True. I don't think Tim's ever went into a Fury game and it's been like, oh, Fury is one seven zero. It has never been yeah. like that for that man. It's always you know, I'm afraid he's he's just just gonna have a heart attack because it's just too much for him. He's he's an old solar Tim. Uh, so yeah, I, Fury just can't keep doing it to the man. He just he can't take it. He can't. Fury needs to chill. He has a wife and kid they need to think about for his sake. <laughs> Yeah, game was fun because the game that we had, uh, well, when I was watching BDSIG, I'm just like, this game literally doesn't matter for jack shit. So I was paying more attention to this one kind of out of the corner of my eye. And then that game ended earlier, so I got to come back and watch this one. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, if we want to keep on trucking through this, so we have a little bit more time to touch on the, the bracket once we're done. I had SSG Empire, the rematch. So we, uh, I was worried about teams deciding to run things back against SSG because what we had so far was... Um, they played Furia twice on Cafe, and Furia got the overtime win the first time, and then lost in regulation 7-5 the second. So they, uh, Empire opted to, in the ban phase, not take Villa out, and it was left up as the, as Decider. And it wasn't a 7-5, it was a 7-4. Space Station got one more round on him this time. Uh, I didn't think that the rematch was worthwhile, because SSG were playing a style of Rome where they would relinquish just enough map control for Empire to kind of get into a comfort zone, like lull them into a false sense of security. And then Rampy pops up out of the bathroom because nobody, or out of the bathtub, because no one like drones the bathtub for some reason. Oh, if you just like, uh, I remember just this. Oh. over to the left a little bit. Empire, like, come come to the UK. Come, we'll teach you. <laughs> we'll show you that stuff shouldn't happen. Yeah, they would unleash the roamers after they made sure that they had given Empire a, a, enough room to feel like they could start mm -hmm. on their execute. Um, and then they just kind of popped up out of nowhere. Rampy and Fultz were both going bonkers. Um, Bosco and Hot and Cold both had some really good clutches in this game. Um, and th this is actually where I went back and double checked the stat about them being the only team to have four players with two clutches apiece. And then that stat only continued when they, when they went into the Damwon game and those stats just went up. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing about this game that I thought was cool was, Jesse, you remember what they were doing uh, in the NAL when they played on Clubhouse and they had Bosco being the one to switch over to Ying? He would switch off of the yeah. flank watch and play Ying. In this case, it was different because they kept Bosco playing Lion, but they switched Hot and Cold to Ying, and it was executes like off of both of those in tandem. It was Candela, then you'd, you'd uh, activate the EU1D at the same time, and Empire are completely thrown off their shits. Either they can't hear where a plan is going down, or they can't move in to stop it because there's someone always covering back from Vault, or uh, you know, if they're on ABG, there's somebody over by Bar Door. Um, it was working really, really well, and it was because empire got thrown off their rhythm on defense and then when they made the shift and over to attack hot and cold was kind of the flex man he would play the buck the yana or the ying and uh yeah they totally deserve the win i don't think empire was really they might have been estimating that they were going to go back to villa for the rematch but they should have gone like anywhere else because they were like ssg were dialed in for this game i can understand why empire went to want to try and take villa again because if you look at the first game right Everyone knows mm -hmm. about that clip, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. They, they, they would sat down and they would have looked at that clip time after time after time. And it would have, like, that, to concede that round, it must be the worst thing in the world as a competitive team. It must feel so, so bad. And they probably want revenge in that. And it's like, that kind of, let's do it again. We would have won that if this didn't happen. That was kind of their mentality going back into it. But, again, SSG, very, very strong Villa team. I think Villa... I love the the way that I think in the meta it's really gotten away from the whole let's anchor on site and a lot more roam game has really came into it. I, I think that the attackers have been having a lot of issues at the moment with Villa and I think Villa is still run, just kind of running away with the whole defender side of things at the moment. And, you know, SSG, whenever you think about SSG, you know, they on Clubhouse, you think what they did to that map and how they reinvented, you know, a map which you can't really roam on and, and do these kind of off-site holds. You think what they did, they're equally doing the same on Villa now. So very, very strong team in that map. Funky bands as well. A little bit, yeah. Bands there? A Rooney? A Rooney Flores. A Rooney. A Rooney's such an underrated band, but she's so good. And a lot of teams have... She's a I... comfort pick now. I if do want to say rate, it's the really good bands. Well, I do want to say I don't know which is wrong, but Liquipedia says it was Thatcher or Rooney for Space Station. Oh, uh, was it? Well, so I think it might, uh, been, not... might be a graphic swap. I don't know. The thing I did take away from the Aruni ban was just 
it was Space Station kind of having an insurance policy to make sure that, that when they went for the Ying strategies, when they switched over to attack in the second half, that there wasn't something else they had to worry about burning, because Empire yeah. were probably going to worry about, like, they'd stick a Jaeger, but then aside from burn util, uh, it meant that SSG didn't have to worry about bringing somebody for flashes to, like, throw a rock back through the Aruni Gate so that they were able to get the plants off um, effectively once the Candelas went through. That was kind of what I took away from it. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. So, the even if Flores is wrong, there we go, we have it corrected now. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought this was a really good game from SSG, and it ended up being the thing that catapulted them into playoff contention in the first place. Um, even if Empire had forced this game to OT, uh, if they had gotten uh, two more rounds won as opposed to one more round lost in this matchup, then they, they would have still been fighting with Dom1 for that uh, second spot in the group, but it just wasn't to be, and it kind of sucked. That kind of... Um concludes the games that like mattered it did there yeah. is there is uh one game if i can like go back in time a little bit i wanted to talk about it's the sonics nip matchup because this one was seven five it was pretty close game um and i didn't have as much like copium and hopium for uh sonics <laughs> but you know this was one that they did almost pull out um it was on clubhouse uh, and Sonics ended up banning like Zofia Bandit, Bandit, according to yeah. Wow. So they were really going for like it was Bandit Kaid banned. So there was no electricity at all. Left the Thatcher up as well to really get crazy with it, and it, it started off pretty good, I would say, um, for the Sonics. They started off like being able to make some bold plays on their attacks. I really liked their takes on Clubhouse, and similarly, I think some of the setups that NIP were bringing out were a little bit uh bad i mean they were playing on like cash with like nothing but roamers right they were playing drone denial all over the place and then they just had like kamikaze swinging breach on smoke so that wasn't great and sonics even played well on their defenses they were playing pretty aggressively but it was working right up until round nine nip call attack timeout and they absolutely turn it around and slam it Pain. there's one there's one round in particular though that i wanted to highlight there's a there's a clip out there right from super stream where he's talking about um alibi right and he's talking about how alibi's utility is like totally worthless and like that's not... an old clip isn't he like ratting yeah. on milos in that clip yeah i think so i think so he's talking about this like alibi's utility is worthless blah 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 um bad link you need it again okay well i gotta send it again but i just want you to remember that while you watch this clip okay I do remember super criticizing it. What did, uh, were NIP running it in this one? Is that what was going on? So NIP were running an alibi, right? And, um, and, and just, just watch this clip. I think I sent the link over this time. I think it's going to work, but, uh, I believe this is later on in the first half when they have, they're still fighting to kind of get that advantage, um, to get that three, three split, which is what they will eventually get, but they don't, you know, they don't have it yet. And here we go. We'll load on in. Right. So, Man advantage, very low time, 15 seconds. Super has the kit, okay? He's got to get in, he's got a frag. There's an alibi clone, okay? Walks through it, that's fine. Seven seconds, gets a kill, awesome. Walks through a second alibi clone in what? the smoke, and he's on pings, <laughs> and he's wall banged. That is why alibi utility can be pretty Genius! Useful. No! Genius, <laughs> no way that happened. It doesn't oh get more way. ironic than that. It <laughs> literally can't. <laughs> That is, that is great. I love the way also, just a little minor thing, I don't know what it is, right? But I just love the way you said, like, NA people, don't know what it is about NA people, right? You guys call the diffuser. God knows how many things, because I'm hearing case. Oh, <laughs> classic, case. A classic is, yeah, I've got case. Yeah, bro, yeah, I'm planting case. I'm, pl I'm planting the case. That, that's another one. I don't know why. It just drives me insane. <laughs> I don't know what it is. What do you call it? Diffuser? I don't, diffuser, because yeah, that's, that's what it's literally so called. Nice. That's what it's called. Americans do kind of have to have like shortened lingo for everything. Like we'll it's give just, everything nicknames, hundred percent. It's just a classic. Like yeah, I've got case. Like it's just I don't know what it is. That's the all <laughs> only thing I hear from NA is that. <laughs> just drives me around the bend. The fact that he didn't shoot those two, mm. Gemini, like man. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you see players that like walk through a room, and it's almost like they've got a mini game where they've got to shoot like the mute jammer in the corner, the Barkley camera oh. in, the, in the. You know, mm -hmm. like they've they've got to go through this like like just shoot it man like <laughs> it's a good example of why it's like it's just so situational isn't it it really is yeah all right so that game what did that one end up mattering for i mean because because for that one sonics if they had gotten the full three sonics points pride. 
Yeah, I mean, kind of, but uh, uh, they were, they, were they needed BDS to like point. lose everything, right? Yeah, so they were in it because it was only so, a five point difference and not six, and they would have had tiebreaker if it was six. But that was why right. that game against BDS yesterday going to overtime was pivotal because mm. it meant they weren't knocked out yesterday. They were knocked out today because of that loss. So the casters were talking about implications for that game. Basically, before that game started, um, Sonics still had a chance of making top two. Um, however, BDS versus IG ended very quickly. So in yeah. the middle of that game, Sonics lost the ability to qualify for um, for bracket, but obviously they wouldn't have known it. That was kind of earlier in the round, so I think there was probably still uh, an opportunity there. But yeah. Gotcha. All right. And then for the other games that didn't end up mattering, I had on B Stream uh, Vitality and Team 1. Vitality won that one. Cool. Didn't matter. Alamal still got 16 kills, but Vitality kind of wanted to like leave quickly. That was the vibe that yeah, I got. That, that was bank game, wasn't it? Was that bank? That was bank. Yeah, it was seven four. Yeah. Did you not see some of the stuff Vitality did? Vitality were pulling out some weird <laughs> stuff in that yeah. game. I was saying free man drop like lobby hatches. Like I was seeing some shit that I wish I didn't see. But yeah, fair play. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Vitality they know it meant nothing. Go out and have fun. So I mean, fair play to them. Yeah, yeah, the the game didn't matter for anything, but that one might be uh like fun just like to go back and rewatch because yeah, because yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. team one at this point were also locked in for first seed in this group, so that they weren't gonna lose anything. So literally for neither team, uh did it matter for Jack Hall. Um and then the other games on B Stream that I had were OXG and Chiefs. This was Chiefs getting another win over a GIMP OXG. Only note that I had about it was that it was like uh it really sh it, it shows that um they won a defender sided bank did chiefs and it's like if you don't have fox a like that's just how pivotal of a piece of this offensive puzzle that he's been for this team and the fact that you had to play like everything with hopes you lose one player can't adapt quickly like uh, to your situation because hopes just doesn't play the game on the reg um and it turned into a scenario where it flipped the script on what we've seen from bank this entire tournament of it being an attacker's haven and chiefs end up winning it so that was the other dub that they got. The only games the Chiefs won, unfortunately, were against OXG. They had that one close game against Rogue on Bank on the first day, and then every other game I think they had was, was relatively a stomp, and they, did, they didn't have a chance to stick in it. And then the last game that I had was Invicta Sonics. It was IG's only win, which uh, I thought Sonics, like, they should have won this game. The fact that they were 0-2 on the day was kind of an embarrassment. Um, and they played on Oregon, which is a map that Sonics have, like, Jesse, they've, they've avoided this, like, since stage one. They, like, it's not that they have banned it outright well, so much as they've just kind of been avoiding it. I believe stage one, Sonics just dominated on Oregon. They beat, like, everybody there. Yep. Stage two, it got perma banned against them. Every team banned Oregon against them. And then stage three... They didn't end up playing it. I don't know if they were banning it a bunch or if... Uh, oh, no, they did play it a little bit in stage three. They played it... No, I'm looking at the wrong team. Yeah, I think they were... Uh, they never played it. I don't know if they were banning it a bunch or if other teams were banning it against them. But probably yeah. a little bit of column A, column B. Uh, if there is stats for this one, by the way, Tango, I'd love to pull it up because there's one funny thing about this game. Uh, and it's... and uh, Entry was being dominated by Gig playing Ash. Like that was the, that was the way that they won. The way that they won was they needed to put him on an entry roll and just let him flex because he was going crazy. He was six and two on entry against the Sonics team that had a phenomenal entry to, like statistic in stage three. Like, but love of God, man, he was going crazy. It was really really fun to watch. Ninety two percent cost as well. Yeah, bro. <laughs> I look at him go. It's the best game he's ever gonna have. I've sat next to Gig. Gig was one of the first people. This is well off topic, but excuse me. Yeah. Gig was one of the first people that came to a community night that me and Tim put on, me and Ace, oh, way sick. back in the day. Because we actually live like five miles away from each other. I don't know why I looked out the window then, but that's the thing you do if you live close to someone. Um, <laughs> anyway, we were sat in this in this like gaming arena sort of thing where we were putting the night on. And I was watching Gig do a terrorist hunt, and it it was. It was another level of like it was just it was the coach for Eminem at the time. He wasn't a player, but he was obviously right. decent. But I was still like in a little bit of awe at how good he was at the game because at this point I was like brand new, fresh green, like not even seen, like not been to an event, not done anything. And even then, I was a little bit like, damn, he's a lot better than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, it's nice uh, to see him do well. Yeah, he's no, 100%. Four, apparently he's fourth highest right now with opening kills across everyone. Wow! Wait for the whole tournament? Oh god! Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait. 14, all right. I'm, apparently, uh, that's I'm pulling CG up to confirm CG. that. So, yeah. Plus minus or overall? Um, I hear overall. Um, so apparently Leon's on 17, Psycho and, and Shiko are in 15, and Gigs in 14. So yeah, take take of that what what you will. But that's all oh, right. Seeing. So not in terms of positive entry though. 
Uh, just no, in terms of pure entry yeah, kills. Yeah, so he's, he's 40 yeah. getting the entry kills, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So, yeah, he's he's tied up with... He's got joystick. the same number of entry kills as joystick. joystick. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Only Not a bad person Shai to be tied Kong. with. And also keep in mind that this IG team went 1-5 and five as well. Like, just keep in mind, like, yeah. they were not winning yeah. games and he was still <laughs> able to do this. What was the the highest rating for anybody on IG? Uh, okay, so Speakeasy at like a yeah. one point one, and he's very like considerably far down the list, but still. Speakeasy is and interestingly there. Speakeasy, the best player by rating on IG, but went three and eleven on entry. I have no idea what was going on with the team and their Whoa. entry stats. Yeah, I kind of want to see what their stats would have been like before Gig got all those kills to see like who was leading the pack. I want to say he might have actually been leading in the entry statistic even before this. Because he got he had six kills and Jordan would have only had like four or five. Wow. Yeah. Curious. Hey, props to Gig. I'm happy for the guy. Props he had to some, Gig. Yeah. He stuck in there. Okay. What games did you um, have on Istream, by the way, that didn't really matter so, for you? Yeah, so I had a couple of games. Um first we had Sandbox Dark Zero, nobody cares. Dark Zero won, but it was meaningless. Who cares? Then we have Phase Clan versus Rogue. Um, this game mattered for first seed, so winner got first in the group, loser got second in the group. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it very quickly. Um, I thought the Phase Clan, it was on Clubhouse, had some really good takes. Like some of these uh, takes were very complex, whether it was sort of like a gym defense where they're defending on cash, they would both be pushing breach whilst also pushing from construction in on a cash at the same time. Doing a lot of really well coordinated pinches like that. Um, so I thought Phase, that's sort of where they wanted out. First half they started on defense was pretty even, but those attacks were kind of the key point for me. Mm. Then we saw BDS versus NIP. Uh, I spent most of this game arguing about um, formats in uh, group chats and uh, <laughs> on Twitter. So I didn't really watch this game, but uh, yeah, it wasn't really relevant. Should have been more hype than it was, but I digress. Um, BDS ended up taking it. Well done, Jacob, 7-4. And then the one that people care about, SSG damn one. So if SSG won this game, they would have secured top seed. If Dam1 won this game in overtime, they would have secured second seed. Um, and if Dam1 lost this game in regular time, they would have got third seed and Empire would have made it through because Furia shit the bed um, on the B stream. So Dam1 really, really needed to win this game. They did it. Um, they didn't let Fear or Empire overtake them. Which was huge. They got to six rounds, and uh, it was a big one. I didn't write any notes because it was so just like crazy hype. The Bosco got some clutches. Coded had a lot of big plays. Gas had uh, some some good plays as well. And uh, yeah, this one was this one was hype. The second last round, when Dam One Kia were on match point and everything mattered, they literally just didn't plant. It was a two v one. They had the guy cornered in dirt. And the other guy had the defuse kit, but he didn't press F fast enough, and they lost the round because yeah, of it. If that happened. was how they would have lost that, that would have been tragic. They were already locked in for playoffs at that point, but they didn't have the number one seed. So uh, that was kind of wild. But yeah, uh, damn one take it, and they make bracket. It seemed like it kind of took Yas a little while to get going in this one, too. Am I am I crazy in that assessment? Almost like he had like three kills up to like the first five or six rounds or something, and they couldn't really do anything until they shifted over to their attacking half. Was that kind of the idea? I think on defense, like, damn one were kind of struggling. They did keep it very even. It was a 3-3 split, even, but, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They did in terms of rounds, but, like, their wins were kind of, like, scrappy. Like, Woogie Man got a C4 to stop a plant. Round 4 was very chaotic as well. Um, it, it felt like SSG were taking a little bit more dominant uh, of victories when they were winning. But, yeah, that second half was when things really started to pop off. Rin um, had a really good push in round 7. Uh, yes, I had written down. I did take some minor notes for this one. Um, round nine, the entire team is pushing through Jacuzzi onto Jim, right? Um, and Yas just jumps in construction. There's like two minutes left on the clock. Runs through sight, rips the heads off of like two players. And SSG are on a 2v4 and their two players are roaming. Because again, the clock says like two minutes. Ridiculous play. So I think Yas had some really big impact later in the round. But yeah, early, he wasn't really there. And this this damn one side very good attacking clubhouse side very very good which i think is Definitely. always going to be a positive for a, a map that can be you know pretty defender sided at times considering the bans and i mean if you looked at the bans for that game especially you're dealing with you know the habana ban you're dealing with um you know the Thatcher ban as well it's, it's going to be tricky to get through a lot of the utility that defenders have so the fact that they've been able to win those attacks is it's a strong card to have up your sleeve it really is 
the thing that I didn't want to have happen for this major, which was kind of the same thing that happened for Mexico, was the idea of Yas being the one to like statistically pull them through a whole bunch of rounds. Because there were some games where Yin uh, or Rin was on and he was off, but more often than not, I think he he was kind of middling overall, like statistically. And sometimes he'd have really good games where he'd pop off and he'd he'd be a run out monster and he would. Uh, he, he grabbed some kills, come right back, and he'd be like locked in. I, was he still kind of like the same on-off player that he was? Because I don't want this to all be on Yas's shoulders. Like Woogie Man and Coded can hold their own. Like Coded Goated is a good saying, but uh, <laughs> Yas is like still like the tip of the spear ultimately. And I, I don't want it to turn into a case of he has a bad game and the team can't like bounce I mean, back or something. In that game, Yas was the lowest rated player on the team, and they still yeah. won. So there's your, there's your. Uh... There, there's your worries, Jacob. It's gone. They, he didn't even have the best of the game, and they still won. All right, good. I, be I believe on the first half, like, coded on, like, hard support had, like, 10 kills or something through the first, like, six rounds or something crazy like that. Like, he nice. was a top frag um, on Thermite Smoke. So, like, yeah, this is, this is a deeper team that I think uh, people give it credit for. Cool, cool. And that was happening like uh the stakes for those guys was wasn't something that, that they were like super aware of either correct because I, they knew going into that matchup that if they were to get just like minimum one point if they got six mm -hmm. rounds and they they would be confirmed because they still had enough points over empire but the game that was happening uh in parallel to this one was empire furia which is where furia were free this was the freest I've ever seen this team. I hate to rag on your they boys, Ali, but they for the over. love of God, they didn't know how to drone. It was four rounds straight of not... It was four rounds straight of not droning. Then they call attack timeout, and then they decide to fix their drone problems. Uh, and it was... It, like I don't understand how it... Like, it was a fundamental part of Coastline. It, it's going to require some intel. They were acting off no intel. They were face checking. They just kind of decided it wasn't like worth their time, so to speak. Empire didn't even really need to try in those first couple of rounds. Um, yeah. The the last two rounds, they still like did drone after Twister was kind of like, hey, why are we not doing this after after calling the tag timeout? But it was still a five one half, and I don't know if uh, do we have stats on this one, Tango? I don't know if we do because uh, the stupid thing about this that's the space nope. game. Good oh, try. Well. I'll find it here. Because uh, Lemda, I don't think, had a kill the whole game. Yeah, he was 0-8. That's why I called Lemda the liability. He was... Well, he, he, well, it's a game that means nothing. I mean, to we've them, seen this before, Ali. Yeah. We, we, we've seen Furia. Whenever they're already qualified for something and they play a game that doesn't matter, they don't care. They, they, just, they troll their ever-living hearts out. They just roll over. And it's like they're literally sitting there and they're, you know, I think Fantasy playing for, you know, an ace. That's it. He goes into that round thinking, oh, let's see if I can get a clip. Which it, it's a bad habit that Fury get themselves into, but it's it's not uncommon. I think the uh, the, the counter arguments that I because there are some people, right, that I've heard that have been like upset, like Fury, oh, they didn't try, they rolled over for Empire, blah, 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 blah. But I will say, like, Empire are the team that got themselves into such a strong position, um, you know, without. Uh, without having to beat Furia, right? The worst team. So, like, Empire did, in a way, earn that uh, kind of free win against Furia. Didn't even matter in the end, so, like, nobody's going to be too upset by it. But, uh, you know, Empire, whatever. They they got a bit of an easy game, but I think that's okay. I think they still earned it. It's the same as the right. Team 1 game we saw earlier. Yeah. That is also true, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we're at a point, we're at about like an hour and a half or so far done on this stream, but I think before we end up wrapping up, we usually end up talking about like the games that we thought were like super pivotal or super entertaining, and we can probably still do that. But let's go ahead and talk about the bracket. So uh, we'll throw this up here in just a hot second, but let's talk about like the seeding before we end up going into things. So it's still the same idea from Mexico. It was the number one seeds against an, a random number two, and it was a literal random draw because Milos was doing it on stream. We saw that uh, at the beginning when we started the post show. So the number one seeds were Face Clan, Team One, NIP, and Damn One, which means there is no, there was no possibility before the draw of there being a Latam versus Latam uh, quarterfinal that was only going to be relevant in the semifinals, and then Damn One filled in the gap for the other one. And then the number two seeds, respectively, were Rogue uh sandbox bds and space station so this was like pre-draw was going to be super intriguing simply based on how things were going to swing there is now because of the draw 
a guarantee that one of the Korean teams will be going to a semifinal and still the possibility that we are going to have an all well, like, like an all LATAM grand final could be an interesting culmination yeah. for how that region has played out over the, the span of the past year. So there really isn't a world in which I, I hate how this bracket goes out and we'll get a second to look at it, maybe do like some way too early predictions or some legitimate predictions if you guys want. But um if we've got it ready or prepped out, we'll just kind of wait for a second. I, I will say, like, while we're building the bracket, okay, we just got it. There we go. Um, but the nice thing about this is uh, whoever picked the times, the times for these are now on Liquipedia. Um, they've worked it so the APAC games are earlier, so that Sambo, that Korean game, Dam One Sandbox, is happening first, which okay. is a better time zone for Koreans. And likewise, the SSG game is dead last. So um, if you're an NA fan who just wants to watch Space Station, that game is happening at, I believe it's 11.30 Pacific. 11 30 a.m so like that's pretty that's pretty good timing and i appreciate that from the organizers yeah <laughs> that's a that's a nice touch i, I am we're, we're gonna get up anyway like to watch every single game to make sure the post show is still good but uh, yeah, yeah. Game it doesn't goals. apply to I us can't do it. I can't no. <laughs> i'm sorry you'll catch it on wikipedia that's fair. All right. I don't, I don't so I'll tune into Wikipedia. I'll tune into the post show. That's what I'll do. <laughs> I'll though. not mess a thing. Yeah, because we really, really are masochists at the end of the day. So do we want to do we want to work kind of from from top left for the quarterfinal and just, just kind of work our way around and talk about who we think is going to win? So we'll start. I mean, yeah. How do you with the. Like, well, how do you I mean, start I think like top this? top left like, is probably the easiest place to start, this? isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And, but I just I, I hate the matchups <laughs> happening in quarters and it, it couldn't be something that happened in the semifinals of the grand final oh. SI 2020 grand final rematch NIP Ooh. space station love of God gentlemen you know what we'll go left or right as uh, as we have the webcams oh. up here we'll start with Ollie what do you think I'm going to preface this by reminding everybody that these are now best of threes grand yes. finals best of five but all of these quarters and semis are going to be best of threes so things get a little bit different. And I think it maybe makes the most difference when we get down to the bottom right. But seeing as we're starting top left, NIP versus Space Station, best of three. NIP. I have to do it. I have to do it. I can't do this. I can't choose. I can't. I... Is there a pass option? Because I just... Yeah, I don't think it's going to be an easy know. game. It's going to be a banger. I... I don't know how anyone can, can say who's going to win. I just what don't we know bring because you on for a demo. You're hit right. Here's the scenario, right? You've got NIP, a team which have looked shambolic in the regular play and in the regular season of you know their online league, and you've got against Space Station, who have been you know arguably one of the best teams in the regular stage in every region. In every region, SSG have looked that good, and then you put them together in a line environment. Both teams have performed really well. You know, SSG, I think they have that consistency. They've got it on lock. I think they're really starting to get, you know, things are clicking for them really well. And you've got NIP, who, you know what they can do in a tournament. And, oh, I, I... That's that, And that's exactly uh... why I say NIP. Because I know that they're a tournament team. They get better the deeper they get in. And we've already discussed how clutch SSG have had to be to I'll get make to the this argument. point. How many I'll more make... clutches have SSG got? I'll make, I'll make the argument, right? I think... SSG at the moment, I think their individual players look to be better on form than the, than the five players in NIP. That's my opinion. That's just what I'm taking from it. And also keep in mind, you think of the group that SSG has been put into and what they managed to do in that group as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think the groups have been point. a big yeah. difference. Big, yeah, big sure. difference. Because, I mean, if you look at Group C, it is the biggest skill difference between teams in that group. The top two and the bottom two, there is a, a chasm between them. So I don't know how much you can read into that. It it's you know I think the fact that SS the uh, I think the fact that NIP beat BDS has almost sold me, but the fact that they didn't do it twice maybe not so much because that's what I mean. NIP whenever they come up against a half decent side they struggle, and SSG are a half decent side, so this is where I'm I'm worrying. I do think there is some credence to the idea that Space Station not only survived the group of death that everyone like looked at from uh, from before. They won rounds regardless of whether it was a clutch factor or not. And like at the end of the day, the, the fact that you have a round counter ticking upwards by way of overall success, if it's team or individual, that still does count for something. Um, but they also did it like, what was their record overall? They, they were th uh, three regulation wins, two overtime losses, one regulation loss, which to me is still really, really impressive. And 
I don't think that that's something that you can necessarily discount. They still look like a fantastic team, even if the record still shows three wins, three losses. And I do have to agree, NIP kind of got a gimme group. Not only because Invictus wasn't you know, capable of playing up to full strength, but I didn't have any faith the Sonics were going to go anywhere. And it was just a matter mm -hmm. of, are NIP the number one or the See, number two seed? NIP read like a number two seed team to me, and Space Station, based upon their group of death performance, could very well have been number one were it not for Dam One sneaking over with a regulation victory. So this matchup on, like, might not even have happened if, if Dam One won an OT as opposed to regulation. Um, I, I, I have a new rule, and it's that I don't bet against Latin America. I'm I'm picking NIP. It pains me, but I'm I gotta go with yes, NIP no. right now. So dominant so far, um, you know, in, in in this year. And I know they didn't have the greatest stage, but they slammed their group. They beat BDS when nobody thought they could. And a couple of these games do legitimately give me hope. Not just betting on the region, right? That first game against IG, they're down five one for the first half. They are able to pull that one back. They've got this that mental true. fortitude. Yeah. The same thing happened in that last game against uh, Sonics when we just saw today. Sonics are rocking them in that first half. They start pulling the rounds in on defense as well. NIP call attack timeout. They counter it perfectly. The adaptation's always there. The mental fortitude's always there. They beat out BDS when it mattered. I don't care what happened in that last game. I didn't even watch it. <laughs> NIP are a team that can win against anybody they go up against. And for SSG, I think SSG's a great team. But this is the team that choked out the 8-7 game against Damwon Kia. Yeah. This is the team that barely was able to scrape by against Empire and Furia in every single one of their games. They lost that 8-7 against Furia as well. I just don't know that like when these two teams go up against each other, when the pressure is the highest, that I'm going able to go with SSG. And that's the biggest thing for me. I just I looked at SSG and I looked at some of the games and it, they were choking. They were choking. They were throwing, and it wasn't clean. It wasn't clean. You talk about the round counter ticking up. That's fine, but there were a lot of opportunities for them to close games out much sooner than they did. And I think they could have added. They could have easily secured themselves top spot, regardless of a regulation win from Dam One. They could have done that themselves. All right. So most people kind of in the NIP camp, but Demo and I are very reluctant, I think, to let go of Space Station, which is kind of <laughs> demos. Like, De I'm, demos I'm not NIP. Look I'm not picking. I'm on the no, no. I'm on the fence because I still consider this <laughs> NIP team as the Mickey Mouse team. I still, I'm not sold. It's still the Dis It's still Disney in pajamas. I'm still not after what they did in that stage three. I'm not letting anything by this team. No chance. So we'll we'll see what happens. All right, let's switch things up and let's go right to left on this one where we're talking about uh, Team 1 and Rogue. Jesse, you start. Okay, um, well, as mentioned, I don't bet against uh, Latin American teams, and this <laughs> one is even more decisive for me. This one seems more like one, a gimme, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Team 1 looks so strong here at the entire group yeah. stage. Alamau is popping off, and I even said that very first game against Sandbox, Alamau was like the one player that I didn't really see show up in that game. But since then, I mean, he has been very, very strong. Uh, again, the only match that they lost was... Oh, sorry. They lost against Vitality twice. The first one did uh, matter quite a lot. That was one where they choked. They had a huge lead, 5-1 half, and then Vitality slammed them on attack, and Team mm -hmm. 1 looked very scared. I don't anticipate that's going to happen in this game. It could, but over the course of three maps, I mean, if there's one team that's had a, a strong mental... And anything you've learned from Mexico, it's got to be Team 1. Rogue, on the other hand, I mean, what? They get fourth in Europe. Honestly, they didn't look that good in their group. I thought Group A, with the exception of FaZe Clan, looked very weak overall. The free group. That final, it really was. That final 7-3 between FaZe Clan and Rogue to determine who got the first seed really felt like this is what Rogue are. You know, I mean, Rogue lost to Oxygen today. I, I cannot pick them <laughs> to beat out against Team 1 in this quarterfinals. So congrats to TSM on SI as well, if this comes true. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to mention there's a little bit more of a want for Team 1 to win this, especially if it means TSM are capable of winning. I'm turning into God I mean, right now, by the way. I mean, you I you say realized. that, Jacob. You say there's more of a want for Team 1. Isn't there as much as a want for Rogue to get the invite? Is that uh, not equally well, as important the for them to play for? Maybe. You know? I, was <laughs> I don't think, I don't no, think Team 1 are playing for TSM. Team 1 are playing for TSM. involved in the actual game, like yeah, yeah, Rogue, Rogue know what this means. It's still yeah. gonna. They, it's still the freest game in out of the four for me, and I think it's still the most difficult game that Rogue could have. Was probably the most difficult fixture they could have got. Somebody's put in the chat. Rogue need Jesus to beat Team One. It's a little <laughs> bit, little bit that. out there. It's a little bit out there to say you need Jesus. <laughs> no, it's not but... far off though, is it? Like, let's be honest. 
yeah i'll take rogue i think i'm oh, sorry uh, team one I'm sorry <laughs> That is, that is not what I meant to say. Are we all kind of in agreement that Team 1's taking this one? Just kind of universally? The, the, the only thing that you can't account for and you can't put into a stat line is what SI means, for, means to Rogue. And, and that, is the, that is the immeasurable thing going into this game that could make it so that they, so they're able to pull a result out. That and the fact that it's a best of three. Team 1 aren't great in best of threes. All right. Let's go ahead and flip the script again for the other top of the table, FaZe Clan, BDS. Ollie, who you got? I've, I've had FaZe to win the whole thing since day one. They've had the easiest group, that much is clear, but they also haven't made a single mistake, regardless of, of who they've come up against. What is it? They've got one loss. They lose to Chiefs, I think, early on. Uh, they No, they lost to Rogue was their one loss, and that they was where to Rogue. it... It kind of seemed like Rogue was playing like FaZe and FaZe wasn't playing like FaZe. It was weird. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't see a world where FaZe don't make it out of, of that game with BDS. I think that their form of late, the fact that they were able to come out and win Copa Elite 6 successfully, that was a really big build-up for those guys. Obviously not making Mexico, that's going to that's gonna have hurt them until this day and this is their, this is their revenge tour, as it were. In a crack in stage three, great Cobra Elite Six. Um, I really think it's I really think it's this team's time. The one thing that's worth mentioning about FaZe is that historically, um, and I think only as sh only as, as as far back as stage two, they didn't actually have an analyst. The cameraman was doing all of the analysis work. Now was he they've, really? They've brought an analyst in. Uh, this is as far as I can glean from the interviews that we've had with cameraman. Um, but they've brought somebody in. They've brought an analyst in called Dark and since the the very like first time that we found out that he was in and, and the first winners interview that we did with cameraman it has been a different team and cameraman literally yeah. in the interviews he's talking about like oh yeah last night was really good like i got to put a film on and sit with my girlfriend and chill and like usually i'd be like going through numbers and i'm like what That's so yeah, ma the, the, massive change yeah the, the, the crazy and, and that that change is so visible in the roster and the way it that is, they're playing it is it's yeah. it's really been the night and day difference and since stage three kicked off they've looked unstoppable and and for that reason and that reason as, as well as many others i'm going to put them for this quarterfinal the, the thing with phase is they look as if they found who they were i think during invitation which we've seen them at they did not too bad at invite for, for what it was and their their place that invite was so sporadic you had no idea what they're going to do they were pulling off you know the meme strategies and you know the uh the amaru up patches in free windows you know this crazy rush team who would just catch you by surprise but now i think that they've really you know honed in on what they want to do they can still do that kind of you know crazy shenanigan business but they just look like just such a solid team you know they've got more structure to it um what i'm gonna do i need to go to the toilet i'm not predicting this game because i can't do this like this oh, is, love of god these are the two games for me <laughs> i'm gonna let you guys talk about it i'm not predicting this i'll be yeah well so the reason wow. why I I am leaning a little bit more towards FaZe in this matchup is definitely because of like the reasons you mentioned, like for, from my outside perspective, the fact that they brought an analyst in and their stage three performance like shot through the roof um, by comparison to where it was for most of this year. Team BDS have a coach, which I figured was going to either give them a buff or was something that would help them kind of get over the finish line, so to speak. And I'm kind of hoping that if that happens anywhere, it would make itself yeah. manifest in playoffs. Like, I didn't really know if anything was going to change over the course of best of ones. They were undefeated in the EUL, which I do uh, reckon is still um, a pretty good league, just from a competition point of view. But I also look at this and think that what they did or how they played from stage three or stage two like before they had a coach into this major isn't really stylistically different it feels like the same structured bds team that we know there might be a little bit of like additional support staff help to maybe like alleviate some of what the players themselves were doing because like alems as far as i'm aware was the one who was picking up like a bulk of that work and eagle me's their analyst was doing some of it too mm. they don't look like a different enough team and i think the fact that phase clan are such a drastically changed and now complete roster because of what they've done over the past three months gives me more confidence that they can be the shock factor over bds because i do think it kind of would be a shock win bds have been that established team over and over consistently expected to do something substantial and they haven't and now phase clan could be the team that knocked them out in quarters and honestly i think i think it could happen <sighs> this is such a this is such a tough 
quarterfinal game. I yeah. think you've all expressed that. I would argue that no other like organizations have fielded better teams in the history of Rainbow Six and never won a championship. That's the, like, that's never the won a tournament. Thing. Yeah, that's the big like, thing. You talk about the best teams to have ever played the game, yet never won, and it's BDS and it's FaZe. Like, there really isn't another team that I think compares at all it's to Liquid these squads. Old Liquid before they Liquid made won. changes. Yeah. Liquid, Liquid won, though. I'm talking organization's point of view. Liquid won Pro League Season 7, right? All right, so okay, yeah. wins there. But like, a million Liquid years won ago. LAN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago, but there's a couple same players still, and it's the same org, so I'm counting it, right? So these two teams, I think, really are... I think the winner of this should be winning the whole uh, major. We'll see how they play. I don't know if I'll predict that the whole way through. Um, but I am going FaZe Clan. You know, you've heard my rule. But beyond that rule, I just think they, they've been perfect so far uh, in this uh, in this tournament. And, like, obviously, they dominated their group. It was a free group. These teams weren't very good. But that doesn't mean that, like, you know, FaZe Clan were playing bad either. Like, FaZe Clan were playing really, really solid Siege. BDS had some slip ups. Um, you know, that final game against NIP, although I didn't, I like half watched it. There were some mistakes there that weren't just BDS throwing because the game didn't matter. Um, they won it, obviously, but like that was still one that looked a little shaky against another Brazilian squad. The first game against NIP was difficult for them, their Sonics game was difficult for them. I, I, I just, I think FaZe Clan right now, gun to my head, are probably the team that uh, are going to win the entire tournament. And I wouldn't have said that before this major started. Whoever wins this game wins it, in my opinion. I agree. That's what I, I think. I am inclined to agree, honestly, yeah. I think it mm. it will probably end up being the winner of this game plays the winner of NIP Space Station wins outright. That's just kind of my... that That's my take on it. I, but... Because it brings us in nicely to that bottom right, where yeah. inside of a best of three, that shit housery is going to be so difficult to, like, continue <laughs> to pull off round after round, map after map. I, I just feel like they're going to get taken apart. I don't All feel right, like so, I, I feel like Dan and Kira are just going to. I don't feel like they're going to stack up. See, in the best I, of three. I love I love these kind of games because you're getting a regional matchup, at international land that we've never. I don't think we've ever had two APAC teams go off again. Actually, no, that's a lie. We've had I think Fnatic and Nora, and Nora. back in invite yeah. 2019 to see who would get the semifinals then. So, and yeah. I think uh, they were both at like uh, the Pro League season finals in Milan in season mm. nine, the year Empire won. Yeah. They yes. played each other in the very first game of that, if I remember mm. correctly. So, you know, there's, you know, that's kind of what we're dealing with, isn't it? It's one of these APAC matchups that we haven't had in God knows how long. Everyone's seen, you know, the E versus EU, NA versus NA, LATAM versus LATAM, but to have APAC versus APAC back again. I know people are a little bit beat up saying, oh, the two APAC teams were against each other, one's going home. You still get to see a best of three regional matchup on a LAN, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reality is one of them's going to make semis. If that was the case, then there's a chance that neither of them make semis. <laughs> yeah. Are, are one of the teams willing to sacrifice themselves <laughs> yeah, what, for the greater good? What would good, you rather have? Would you rather have a guaranteed semi final or would you rather roll the dice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Especially since, like, the other alternative, right? If you'd assumed that, like, if uh, if SSG had won that final game in overtime, yeah. Damwon would have gotten second. That means they're both going up against Brazilians for the mm. first seed. I don't see either of these teams beating the BR teams. I'm sorry. No. Ultimately, no. But I think, to me, as much as I appreciate Sandbox kind of bucking the trend of what uh, APAC and, like, Korean teams tend to do, Typically, just from a playstyle perspective, being more explosive, unpredictable, trying to find the things that, uh, like, even the, almost the mentality of we don't know what we're doing, they won't know what they're doing, but they yeah. actually do have an idea about how to channel that chaos. Um, that's what Dumb One play into. Sandbox don't necessarily. They're almost like the most North American or European APAC team I think I've ever seen, probably aside from somebody like a Fnatic who does tend to play into that style more, like, heavily. So I'm giving the game to Dumb One just because... If you're if you're having me play up against like th this is almost like an NA versus LATAM matchup, but just paint with Korean flags painted over it because both of them can be explosive at different times. So I'm going down one. Anyone have a uh, really convincing case for Sandbox? I mean, maybe I the mean, structure is going to pull through. Yeah, you know, it it could be exhausting to to co continually go against Dam One's play style, which we know to just be lunacy. And and maybe if Sandbox are a little bit more familiar with that, they, they might be able to, to pull out some of those structured rounds that we've been talking about. 
Yeah, I think historically you also think about like Damwon as having a very limited map pool, right? With that best of three is gonna be very difficult. I think that's probably like the best argument, but I do think their map pool is better um, coming into this major than it was in Mexico. It looks like they're they're not banning the same three maps for every single series. Yeah, that, that was play. a big critical point. Yep. So that's you know that's positive. I think I also want to go Damwon. Um, just because I feel like this is the team that's going to, again, in that sort of high-pressure, intense situation, are going to come out on top, right? We saw them inside of Mexico when they're in those super important games against NIP. Um, they clutch up. And, like, yeah, they went to the quarterfinals and got slammed by Liquid. But, like, that wasn't a game that was, like, you know, felt like it had any pressure at all. Now, to be the best in Korea, to be number one, to go to the semifinals for the first time from any team ever in your subregion. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. I can see Dam1 thriving in that pressure. I can see Rin and Yas popping off. For Sandbox, I don't know if I can say the same thing. This is a team that has struggled under pressure. Back when they got signed to Cloud9, they, they mentioned that was like a big thing for them. They felt a lot of pressure from the org, or not from the org, but having to represent such a prestigious, or, prestigious org. And, uh, you know, maybe that's going to come back and haunt them. All right. So we're right up against the two-hour mark, which I think is about the, the sign that we should wrap this thing up real quick. Obviously, we had a lot of things that we did need to cover for how this last day of groups was going to go. But ultimately, we knew that there were going to be some games that didn't matter simply due to the format. Um, Jesse, did you want to do a rant against just this format and how it's not double GSL groups and how we well, can improve things for in the future if we're not doing things at a double round robin with best of ones? I mean, listen, the for five hours today, for four and a half hours, we had six games get played on stream and none of them mattered for who actually made it. One of them mattered for seeding. So like this format is bad. We should change it. I know a lot of people have their problems with GSL. So I would be happy to switch to a Swiss system instead, which I know a lot of people have have come out in support of. Obviously, if you watch the CSGO major just recently, they use Switch uh, Swiss system. It's amazing. It's much better. Um, but I, I still think GSL would be a massive improvement over this what we have here. It's just too high of a potential for four team groups to, to have meaningless games. And they're boring, and they can be one-sided, and they can be uh, just bad for viewers and for teams and for everything. So... Yeah, no, we should we should go for a different format because yeah, today it was, was kind of rough until that final game. It was the thing that Monte Cristo kept on talking about when we were in Mexico about it, this is the League of Legends Worlds format, and he like I, I understand like the way in which it works, and from a storyline point of view, it's also nice because you get like a set bracket in playoffs. It doesn't incorporate something like a uh, uh, one map advantage or a lower bracket or anything like that. It's it's something that gives you like an outright four best teams from those groups, but it also kind of doesn't because the format for both playoffs and groups is, is different in what you're playing. You're not playing best of threes, which ultimately the fact that we have so many teams coming to a major event and most of the all of them will play best of ones but then half of them will have a chance to play best of threes and the number of actual official best of threes that we play in rainbow six under this format is so minimal i do wish that we went back to that kind of thing because everyone plays in best of ones in league play but when you go to an event there should be some other caveat some other thing that switches the formula up so to speak and there's a lack of it right now and i do wish that there was more so yeah e even if it means a return to something like a gsl style that to me at this point is more advisable than what we've currently seen we've tried it for two majors um let's get something different going for majors in the future and i, I don't think that we're going to have something like this work out for si this year i would hope that we don't but we also have 20 teams going to si so we have a couple different right. ideas for formats that we can try out for next year with with 20 teams you basically have to do two groups of 10 um and you could do like four groups of five if you wanted but it has to be round robin there's really no way to make anything else work unless you get kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but round robins are better when there's more teams anyways, yeah. so it's actually fine. I think last um, last SI was pretty good from, yeah, from my, sort of my point of view in, in terms of working on it. it was I felt like the games were good. There was a lot of uh, a lot of variety in terms of the teams that we were seeing. The big I think we had two groups of 10, didn't we? Um, yeah. And just sort of ran on through it, which, which works better. And then like you say, it's the amount of teams. You have a four-team group and all of a sudden, double round robin just gets a little bit slightly repetitive. It leads to games that like don't mean anything, especially like on the last especially day. Like, we had, one. yeah, and we had two yeah. games, or we had two very, very strong days overall of mm -hmm. like matches that I think have a lot of rewatchability, things that you can go back and learn if you want. And then we 
like Jesse mentioned, had a four to five hour block in the middle of today for six games that didn't matter. And then we had to like, we, we, had, we had to go from the SSG and Dom 1 and Empire games at the beginning of the day, like halfway through, and then wait until we got those games at the very end, which I, I did kind of feel like sapped some of the fun about like, and also you have talent who were in Sweden who had to cast those games when they meant nothing aside from seeding. Like you might as well do something different, yeah. but I digress. All right. For the two of you gentlemen, is there anything that you'd like to plug, like to shill, any social medias that you want to shout out real quick? The floor is yours uh, to say anything before we go ahead and sign off. Thank you guys for showing up. But if there's anything you'd like to say, feel free. Uh, make sure you guys jump back in for CL. First back again. Uh, next week, obviously, we had this kind of like two-week break where Vader's on, so we didn't get a hold of the mainstream. So obviously, then we kind of had to break for a bit. But we're back again uh, next Thursday, Ollie, I want to say. Question mark. Um, we fly think... out to Paris on the 17th. So in a, yes, a week today, we fly back out there. Um, and a week tomorrow, the games kick back off. So that's going to be the 18th, the EU Challenger League, the best Challenger League that Rainbow Six has to offer. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of a lot of fierce competition out there, but nobody does it like we do in Europe. Um, obviously, I'm just, I'm just ribbing on Jacob and, and Jesse there. But <laughs> realistically... On, we have had some really good games. There's been some pretty close and tight competition. It's still not really too clear who's actually gonna gonna make it into those finals in December. Um, unfortunately, we don't cover who gets into Challenger League. We just hand it off at the point where it gets to the EU finals, and then it's all covered in December. But at least we get to send the couple of teams on their merry way. Yeah, and did, Jesse, did you want to do anything else for your competition as well? Because you still have the daily stuff you were running. Every day in the Discord, uh, whilst the major is on, we're doing watch parties. That means we're vibing inside of the uh, inside of the Discord. It's the Big Brain Club. You can join with this link in the chat right there. Um, we're doing watch parties, which is a lot of fun. You can come chill out. I'm gonna be in there every day from 2 a.m. to I think 2 p.m. We typically go till whenever yeah. the post show starts. Um, so a lot of fun there. Also, if you don't care about that, we do have Discord competitions going on. The prediction competition, of course, is uh, is the big one, right? If you can predict the games correctly, then you're going to win a bunch of cool prizes. Um, currently, we are doing a point system. At this point, you're probably not going to win the grand prize if you're just starting today because we've already had a bunch of play days, and so predictions are already in for the majority of those. Um, at the moment, I have a couple of leaderboards here. At the moment of the of the 48 games that have been played, two people have gotten 32 of them. That's two-thirds right. Dank Banks and Rewind have both gotten 32 points. They currently lead uh, Panada and Ash Lose, not too far behind with 31 games each. Uh, playoffs are going to be three points per... Flynn's not in the top 10. He's out. I'm only giving the top 10. Boxy's Good. up to sixth, though. So there's, there's still some, some names in there. Um, but yeah, uh, we are going to be continuing that on. Playoffs are worth three points per game, so there's there's opportunity to come back if you're down after the group stage. The other big thing we do is daily prizes. So you might not be able to win the grand prize if you're just joining now, but you can win the daily prizes. And uh, every other day, we've had ties for who got uh, first place. But this time around, it is a uh, it's 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 a wash. Last time, if you remember, it was a tie between two guys named Tommy. One was like Tommy A, and one was Tommy something else. Tommy A lost, um, but congratulations to Tommy this time. Tommy Fonto won last time. Tommy A has uh, come out on top with his predictions. I'm trying to find where it said his score, but I actually lost it. He won either way, though, so congratulations to Tommy. I'll send you your skin code. Twice in a row, he's managed to get more than anybody else. Last time, he just lost the coin flip, though, so congrats to Tom. All right, good stuff. Go ahead and join Jesse's Discord link if you haven't already. You you should have had like a huge influx of new people joining. Like what? You had like how many people have you had join that Discord in the past like two days? Like um, over the past two weeks, um, since I've been advertising the, the prediction competition, it's been over two hundred. And Woof. Ollie just joined, so hey. you can be in a cool Discord <laughs> with Ollie. All right. Uh, and Tommy got thirteen out of sixteen games correct today. So there you go. 
Sheesh. There's even less now because there's only eight games per day as opposed to 16. So, and that's only exactly. for one day. It's only for quarters. So mm -hmm. speaking of quarters, that is when this post show is going to come back. We're going to take a break because everything else uh, is taking a break. There are no games we have to worry about tomorrow. Teams get a rest day. They get to go into a little more additional preparation for the matches that they've got in those quarterfinals. And then we have the semis and then the grand final right afterwards, which is a best of five. Every other game is a best of three. So this is where we will go ahead and close things out. Thank you very much much to both demo and extra troika for joining us on this edition of the post show we'll see if we can't get at least one more guest at some point uh as the playoffs progress and it might be somebody who may have tried to go to sweden but at the last second was not able to join and uh, i'm pretty sure you might know who it is if you look at the talent announcement and find one face that so far has we're getting missing. fox we're getting fox it's coming <laughs> i was the thinking show. fox there for a minute as well <laughs> that last god it's like trying to guess it's like you give free hints it's like who is it and it's like applies to quite a few people no no so what we'll do is we'll cut things bikini. off here for right it now it is bikini yeah genius yeah, hundred percent. We pulled him in, but uh, the reason why we couldn't get fresh was legitimately because internet was uh, too shit at the hotel that they're staying at. So maybe we're better off by being home, and I have eight hundred down, so we can kind of do whatever we want. Um, but thank you guys very much for tuning in for this one. Thank you both to the British lads from Challenge League for coming and joining us as well. We'll be back on Thursday. I got a predictions video to go out and do at some point, and then uh, some sleep to catch up on. So I'm very grateful for these great days. Who takes it? Have a good one, everybody. Thank you very much. Take care. We'll see you later in the week.